This is TWIS. This Week in Science, episode number 461. Recorded on Thursday, April 24th, 2014. You're either into it or you're not. I'm Dr. Kiki, and today we are going to fill your head with a couple of clones, a little self-control, and cannibalism. But first... Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. The world is nuts. You've seen it. I've seen it. We've all seen it. We've all been there. Reading the news, looking at images of what goes on, and thinking to ourselves, this makes no sense. The world has gone mad. While well, research into the madness of the world is ongoing, the main reason for it is clear enough at this point. It's the people, people. If you take an average of sanity across the animal kingdom, it becomes obvious that we humans are the most insane thing this world has ever seen. And with great insanity comes great responsibility. How we utilize the unbridled insanity of a sentient mind will determine the fate of the future of our planet and... One day, maybe, if we are insane enough to try other planets as well. But in the meantime, we can focus our attention to a crazy little thing called This Week in Science, coming up next. I've got the kind of mind I can't get enough. I want to learn everything. I want to fill it all up with new discoveries that happen every day. I seek, I want to know what's happening, what's happening, what's happening this week in science, what's happening, what's happening, what's happening this week in science. Good science to Kirsten and Blair. Good science to you too, Justin and Blair. We are here once again to talk about, well, let's talk about friends and we can talk about all sorts of stuff. Science, Keith! Yeah, yeah. Science, we're here for the science! That's right. It's the science. That's why we are all here. We all came for the science. And I brought stories tonight about a cloning breakthrough, microbial madness, and some alternate alternate hypotheses, if I can get those words out. What do you have for us, Justin? I've got animal brains, astronaut brains, and dirty microbes. Mm. So microbed up today, mm. Blair. I have spider selection, a.k.a. spider sex. <laughs> um, insect role reversal in the boudoir. And smart monkeys. That would be us, right? We're smart monkeys. Well, we're, no, we're not monkeys. We're, we're primates. We're, we're apes, technically, right? I primates. don't have a tail. Mm -hmm. mm. New yeah, world if apes. I did, if I did, I'd be a good little monkey. You would be a good <laughs> little monkey. That's right. I have a visceral reaction to that statement. I know, I know. That's why it's so funny. <laughs> so we can all jump into the news with a... Let's get a little, little visceral, everyone, shall we? A little science visceral action. Hockey sticks. Hockey's a bit physical, visceral. But in the case of hockey sticks, when you're talking about it on this show, it's related to climate change. And just popping back in with a story that we've kind of tried to keep track of as it's happened. Um, there was a lawsuit with Michael Mann. Michael Mann actually sued a few people who had sued him and tried to get all of his email communications. Uh, a bunch of groups had applied through the Freedom of Information Act to get access to all of his emails while he was a university professor at the University of Virginia and in uh, during which time he did research in which he developed the hockey stick graph that uh, that basically puts temperature and carbon dioxide on the on the same graph and uh, so anyway he's been harassed and there's all sorts of stuff that's gone on no matter which side of the of the debate that rages you happen to be on it's a it, there's a massive deba debate and he has been harassed by people um, 
who claim that he is is lying about some of the data that he's used trickery, um, and, and and so they've tried various methods to get a hold of all of his communications to find out, you know, get a record of what's going on. Anyway, Virginia's... Uh, yeah. Huh? It's just the, they've used various methods. They've used various methods in the debate uh, in <laughs> climate change, except for science. Except, yeah. Methodology of knowing things in reality. Yeah, okay. Yes, it's true. Virginia's top court, though, ruled... Thursday, that would be today, ruled that... Um, Actually, I guess it was last Thursday. Uh, it ruled that Michael Mann's emails, his electronic communications, while he was a professor, are proprietary work products. Hmm. Which is an interesting ruling, uh, but basically, that the ruling by the by the court uh, decides that none of his emails are going to be available to anyone through the Freedom of Information Act because the Freedom of Information Act cannot. Uh, cannot touch proprietary works. Um, the the interesting, I think, interesting side of this is uh, is, and I, I think that the university would be arguing this that anything that prof every time you are a university employee, you sign a a waiver of your rights, basically, where you say everything you generate while you are an employee of said university is the property of said university. So um, what I'm guessing happened, I haven't read all the details into this, but what I'm guessing happened is that uh, the university argued very well or that man's lawyers argued using these kinds of um, the basis of uh, the university legal system uh, that the work he produced, it's a proprietary PDF uh, work format. So. Yeah, I, I think know. this is interesting for Not a couple giving of reasons. Up his yeah, I mean, mainly because they're going after these emails because they want to be able to poke some hole in this whole argument, right? Yeah, and they have again proven the same quote-unquote hockey stick graph through trying to regenerate it from the beginning. They have. So it's it's not even that this is the only the only record that we we have of the past thousand years of climate data. We have right. other consolidated forms of this information because this was the first and this was like the father of all of the climate change arguments. They these people I feel like they think that if they poke a hole in this one, it all falls like a like dominoes, right? right. If you attack the the original case that they use to argue climate change, then it invalidates everything. Right. But that's not true. And so it's, it's more than anything, I feel like it's a political move because they think that if they can invalidate this very monumental part of it that led to all this other research, then, then they will convince everyone in the general populace that climate change in general is not true. Yeah, yeah, in a way, and it's like how creationists will, will sometimes try to attack uh, Darwin's arguments. Which, right. You know, that's great. Yeah, there's probably plenty of holes in Darwin's arguments mm -hmm. about evolution. But they there's were, plenty of research since then. There's a little work yeah. done since. Yeah. Exactly. There's a little work in the exactly. last 150 years, 200 years now. Um, so uh, another interesting point is that even if they had gotten access to Michael Mann's emails, there have been other cases like the University of East Anglia where uh, the emails were hacked and made public. And um, because they were released to the public, people got access and then tried to go through the emails to show that there had been trickery, scientific uh, sleight of hands, so to say, uh, that had taken place, but on on deep examination of those emails of the climate uh, climate data that had been going been analyzed by that that university and people there they found absolutely nothing wrong with it and it backed up all of it actually backed up the work that they had been doing that much more strongly yeah, so, so really far the email for. tactic is not working very well They're for They're actually everybody. looking for an email uh, correspondence between the professor and the smoking man from the X-Files that's that's the kind of that's what they're hoping actually is out there. Right. Um, and then 
The others, other interesting story, oh, and I was going to say someone asked in the chat room, they assume that this is talking about his school email account and not his private one, and yes, they're talking about his school email account because that would, would be the one that they would potentially be able to get access to through the Freedom of Information Act because it's um, a state-run institution. Um, but the personal email would not would not be accessible by the uh, through the Freedom Freedom of Information Act because it's personal. Um, the other interesting story this week: more stem cell news. This time, um, it's it's still in, in involving the the same researchers that we've been talking about. There is money in, money involved from South Korea uh, that was given to researchers in Los Angeles, and um, we also have Robert Lanza of the, um, what is Robert Lanza's, what is their, uh, whatever, I'm totally blanking on the name of the company. Um, Robert Lanza, Advanced Cell Technology, that's the name of the company, uh, that Robert Lanza is involved in. Um, he's been involved in cloning and stem cell research for many years now. We've talked about his companies several times. We've also talked about work by South Koreans involved in cloning and stem cell quite a lot on this show. Um, last year, there was work in which researchers were able to get um, embryonic cells and take cells from embryos, clone them, and be able to create a clone, a stem cell line from the clones that were created. Basically, um, blastocysts of 150 cells were were developed, and and they weren't allowed to go any further. the The issue with that research from last year is that it came from uh, fetal cells. It came from embryos, so that was really controversial work. This year, these researchers, publishing in the journal Cell Stem Cell, have created. Um, two cell lines from two individuals, a 35-year-old and a 75-year-old man. Um, they were only able to get one, one clone, basically, that would create st that they could get stem cells for each of these individuals. So it's a really difficult pros procedure, and it's not very efficient yet. Definitely not something that we could say it's a breakthrough. It's going to save everybody this year. But what we can say is they took skin cells from adult males, 35 and 75. So age doesn't really matter here. Skin cells from adults got them to fuse using um, an electrical charge. Got them to fuse with an egg cell that had had the nucleus removed. And from that point forward, got them to develop into blastocysts um, that could then be used to create stem cell lines. So what this means is if they can get this research to be um, more efficiently applied, that this, that this could really be uh, one of the big steps moving forward into therapeutic cloning for people who have really serious disorders. Which is awesome. It's awesome, but it's still you know it's like oh they got they did two, right? Okay, yeah. it's a start. It's a start. <laughs> it's a start. And as this um this article from um from the Globe and Mail written by Sharon Bagley who is a really wonderful science writer uh, has a quote from has a quote from Dr. Lanza saying that. Uh, if each stem cell line has to be created from scratch for each patient, the low success and expected high costs mean that, quote, only a few wealthy old men could do it. So at this point in time, we've got cost and efficiency really being a barrier. Um, hopefully the research will become, I mean, hopefully it'll be the, the next, you know, the 3D printer of the future where things will end up being much cheaper to produce, but we're not there yet. But it's pretty cool. Pretty cool news. Uh, Justin, what you got? I've got the largest study of animal intelligence ever published this week. Journal uh, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. The findings? Animals with bigger brains and broader diets have better self-control. So this was uh, the study was aimed at understanding uh, understanding better the animal mind, specifically why are some species capable of tool use, able to read social cues, understand basic math problems, while other animals are not. 
Until now, most studies of animal intelligence required animals to study. And so because of the logistics budget constraints, not all of us having Noah's skills, it only focused on one or a few species of animal at a time. Researchers working at the National Evolutionary Synthesis Center came up with an idea. If they could convince enough animal experts around the world to conduct the same set of experiments, they could test ideas about how cognitive differences in the animal kingdom came to be in a much more rigorous way. So they worked with about 600 animals through the, vicariously through other researchers. Uh, it was three dozen species of bird, mammals, they were going, there were some zoos, research facilities, they had everything from uh, spider monkeys to, to jays, the wolves, I mean they had a, a good array of animals. Researchers put the animals through two basic tests designed to measure inhibitory control, measure of uh, brain function associated with the ability to control impulses, delay gratification. So most animals don't impulse shop, they don't cheat on diets. This isn't something I've, I've heard in context of many with many animals. You know, eh, you know, uh, bonobos are are uh, are great, but they don't they don't have impulse control. You know, they just like never heard that in sort of any way being attributed to a specific animals. Their impulse control. So, <laughs> but the ability they do have the ability to exhibit self control because you know that that. That uh, cat that's waiting to pounce in just the right moment, and on the bird or, or mouse, you know the 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 animals that go out and forage for food or trap food or catch food, what have you, and are bringing it back to the rest of their brood need to have self control, not to just devour all the food themselves. Right? Yeah, but I would think also, like you, you mentioned, bonobos don't have great impulse control. Oh, I don't um, know that that's true. I'm just okay. saying like, I've never heard. I've never heard any animal referred to in terms of their <laughs> their impulse control. You hear this about people all the time. Impulse control is a huge subject amongst human beings. I've just never heard, you know, that uh, that 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 particular spider has bad impulse control. Right? You <laughs> well, you, yeah, I'm thinking with this with the bonobos, they're definitely part of a social group. So, like you mentioned, uh, predatory animals that have to hold back their urge to pounce until they have the right moment to go after their prey. Um, that is going to be some kind of impulse control. There's also going to be some kind of impulse control related to social groups as well because if you just went around uh -huh. doing I'm whatever you want all the time, more on you, that would later. Not, you would not have good good groups. More, more on that later. No, they, they mentioned this in the study. So hang on. So uh, one of the tests, they hid a piece of food between behind or within an opaque plastic cylinder. Basically, they had a two-liter soda bottle that you couldn't see through. And they trained the animals to retrieve the treat inside by reaching around uh, to the open end, which is away from them. So this was, they would, you know, reach out with their beak, paw, fin, <laughs> whatever they happen to have to, to re hand in some cases. They then switched the opaque cylinder with a see-through cylinder, a two-liter soda bottle that you could see through, and to, and to get the food, then the animals had to resist their first impulse, which was to directly reach in front of them and knock down the cylinder, knock it off the table or whatever was in front of them. Uh, so they had to have sort of the patience to know, I, I can see it, i got to reach around. Another test they did... They did like a three, uh, what, it's not a three card money, it's kind of like that. They had the, the three cups upside down and they put the food in one and then they'd move it and they'd show the animal that they were moving it to another cup and testing them to see whether or not they could override the impulse to look in the cup they just saw it taken away from. Mm -hmm. Tougher than it looks, apparently, uh, for some species of uh, squirrel monkey. Uh, squirrel monkeys had a rough time. That squirrel, squirrel monkeys, you can now say, not a lot of impulse control. I can attest to that for sure. Okay. Right. <laughs> so we know those yeah. orangutans. They performed both uh, tests really well. They uh, they were I think in the highest here was they were saying they averaged about ninety percent correct answer. Okay. Squirrel monkeys and something called a cockerel sifica, which I think is also a small is a small primate, not a monkey. 
uh, did terrible. They were right less than 50% of the time. I think that's also true for um, for young children before they have um, gotten a theory of mind. You think? I don't know how yeah. young you have to be because that's kind of interesting. It, hap it definitely happens. You play the cup game or you hide yeah. things with a with a young baby, and they'll just keep keep looking to see the place where they know it's been taken away from. Like it it happens with young kids. Uh -huh. At a certain point, they're their knowledge of the world solidifies and they become more like bonobos, gorillas, and orangutans. Yeah, so isn't that that's object permanence, right? They're yes. they're knowing yeah. that something still exists even when they can't see it. Yes, good and that term. was something that, yes. that we talked about in Crows a few months ago, that Crows had object permanence. This is interesting, this study, because they did this it's so weird with cross species studies because you're testing something that maybe the way you're testing it, it makes sense in our brains, and it definitely could make sense in a primate brain, but is are you really testing impulse control in a crow with that experiment? I'm not convinced you are. Right. Well, yeah. Perhaps not, perhaps not, but here's what was interesting. Here's what, whatever we call this, we're, we'll put it in quotation marks that it's impulse control, but overall, the species with the highest scores had had bigger brains. Because okay. all of those experiments were based on a certain level of understanding and intelligence first before you could then deal with impulse. Well, yeah, maybe. But absolute brain size mattered, but relative brain size didn't. So hmm. it was you know, it wasn't just you've got a big brain for a crow or what have you. It was just mm. the bigger your brain, the better you did on That's the test. interesting. Yeah, so it could be, it's just that maybe some of the differences in this self-control or in this testing may have been due to differences in how the brain is wired uh, mm -hmm. rather than having a big brain for the body, but uh, yeah. In addition to brain size, researchers also looked at whether lifestyle factors may play a role. So one of the, you know, the idea that uh, evolving with a group the larger, the bigger the group, better the more the animal needs to be good at keeping track of social relationships, managing uh, sort of competing things versus cooperating things. They sorted the data by group and uh, group size and found group size didn't matter for this controlled self-control test. Uh, within the primates, researchers did find support for a different idea that primates with superior self-control had more diverse diets. Uh, mm -hmm. So that idea would be these animals, maybe a lot of animals, owe their intelligence to the challenges of having to forage for different array of foods. You know, mm -hmm. if you're if you if you're foraging for fruit or nuts and you keep going to the same tree every day, chances are you're going to starve. This thing is going to be out of season at some point. You know, it won't be there always. So you've got to have different techniques and, and you know, sort of travel different areas. So hmm. that might be a bump to cognitive ability. Is that having a diverse diet leads you to do more things in the world? Hmm. Yeah, and that's a whole other thing because is impulse control across the board a good thing? Maybe it's not. Well, and it I depends would think on what generally, the goal is too. Yeah. It kind of depends on what the goal is. Like I, I'm, I'm already, yeah. I've already put this mentally in the context of Neanderthal. Neanderthal had like a half a million year run as Neanderthal. Yeah, they didn't advance a whole lot uh, beyond Neanderthal technology, but they had an amazingly long run. You know, they had bigger brains than us. Maybe they had more impulse control. Maybe Neanderthal was very wise and serene. Right? Yeah. Eh, we could we could expand. We could come up with new technology, but eh, you know, more technology, more problems. You know, maybe maybe we don't need what comes with it. Eh, maybe I don't know. So maybe maybe the so anyway, actually this is an interesting way of doing this though. Uh, 600 animals, dozens of species. Yeah. Uh, now that they've got this up, they, they've sort of built the machinery, this network for being able to do simple tests. Maybe you mm -hmm. could say this wasn't a good impulse test. Maybe it wasn't. But they're going to be doing further tests. 
I do right. love the cross species test. I think that's fantastic, and we right. should be doing more of that for sure. Uh, one of the yeah. things, right. that even uh, Evan McLean says here, is uh, one particular aspect of cognition may be critical for one species, but useless for another. Yeah. Intelligence itself isn't one dimensional. So that's what they're going to be sort of playing with in the next uh, next studies is also sort of looking at at different ways to dissect uh, animal cognition. Mm -hmm. Whiskey Grenade, uh, Whiskey Renegade, I said Whiskey Grenade, Whiskey <laughs> Renegade um, in the chat room uh, makes a really good point. He says that maybe a wider diet allows more options, so there's less pressure to take what you find, so those animals have more patience, which makes sense. That, yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. Who knows? It's time to be tested. You're watching or listening to This Week in Science, and it is time for Blair's Animal Corner. She loves our creatures, great and small. Buy a pig, build a pig, no pet at all. Want to hear about animals? She's your girl. Except for giant pandas and squirrels. Well, while we're talking about monkey brains, I'll jump right into it. Rhesus monkeys can add. What? What? Yep. Math. Yes. Uh, we know that many animals can make numerical estimates, but a new study from Harvard found that they can teach rhesus monkeys to perform simple addition. So to learn about the monkeys' math abilities, they taught them to memorize values associated with the digits 0 through 9, which is the first step. We grow up, we absorb what numbers mean, but obviously with an animal, you have to teach them what those numbers mean. So they Unlike taught them... Who, it's just intuitive. We're born with it. Well, just because we were, we were raised... From the time we're a baby, we have flashcards of numbers and we're counting and all this kind of stuff because we have the language and we have the we've invented these numerical symbols. It's difficult if you live in a society to not learn what numbers are pretty quick. Yeah. But regardless, if you're a monkey, you don't have that. So they had to initially they had to teach these monkeys what the digits zero through nine meant. They also associated numbers with some letters. And then um, after a value was assigned to a number or a letter, they presented two previously associated characters alongside another single one. And to receive a treat, the monkey had to add the value of the two and then compare the result against the single and choose the greater value. So example, they'd have three and three on the left side of the screen and they'd have seven on the right side of the screen. And so they'd have to pick seven because they'd have to go three plus three is six, six is less than seven, and pick seven. The monkeys were able to choose correctly about 90% of the time. Which is really significant. That's yeah. huge! That's, That's so, so impressive. Fun. I mean, even considering that they were the monkeys in the experiments that Justin was just talking about were not getting 90% accuracy mm -hmm. on just looking at the, a cup that they had seen something get moved to. So that's, that's good. Yeah, so then they realized, these researchers realized, that it's possible that the monkeys had memorized the value of pairings, which is different than addition. So they could have looked at 3 and 3 and looked at that as a symbol that meant 6. Gotcha. That's what they could have memorized. So instead, they introduced a whole new set of characters. So they started over to make sure that it wasn't a fluke where they had just memorized certain combinations. And then once the monkeys had been trained to associate the values with the new characters, they immediately on their own applied math skills once they were put next to each other. So they definitely were adding them together. That's so um, neat. And they had they had lots of numbers, up to 25, and different two sets of symbols. 
right. for these numbers. So they learned all sorts of representations. Mm -hmm. As far as about the 10% of the time that they didn't do very well, they noticed that that was usually when the two values were very close together. So that mm -hmm. suggests to them that most of their math skills were based on making some sort of estimate. So, right, so they're not just like thinking in their head, eight is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and like thinking of a number of actual units. Right, the they're more eight. thinking it's this many and this many makes this many. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so it's more of an estimate. <laughs> Which, for those of you listening to the podcast, <laughs> yes, it's, it really, it's really not something that would help you to have seen it. <laughs> it's about the same, basically. Sorry, guys. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, so monkeys, these rhesus monkeys can definitely do some sort of addition. So this leads to a whole new area of study that could be opened up to all other primates, and then also mapping brains to see how this is happening and adjusting how we understand how humans use math. There's a lot of stuff that could come from this. It's pretty awesome. Yeah, well, there are individuals who do have um, a form of dyslexia that is related to math and that uh, they have issues with with numbers and adding them together. And so maybe there is some kind of... Um, uh, like within the connections of the brain for how the system for understanding numbers is put together, maybe there is a certain wiring pattern or something that is more leads more more towards estimation and less toward exact exactitude. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe there is something, and the and the estimation on the estimation side of things, that that's more ancestral. Right. Well, and I think if, if we can understand that that's, maybe that's just how our brain learns math. Yeah. It's through groupings and estimates, which would make sense when you think back to when your teachers made you memorize your times tables. That's something that I look at that actually is directly related to that. Because if you don't have to do the math of what 5 times 5 is in your head and you just know 5 times 5 is 25, then you can add 25 groupings of 25 together. That's how, that's definitely how my brain works is you break it down into steps. Yeah. And so that's totally what the monkeys did, which is pretty awesome. Anyway. Monkeys are awesome at math, and as somebody in the chat room said, they would probably qualify for a GED. <laughs> hey, hey. Not I'm necessarily. Working really hard for my GED. <laughs> <laughs> I did too. I had to do better. I had to do harder work than that. Jeez. Jeez. Perhaps. Yeah. Not sad. to. Not to. Not. Not. Not to insult <laughs> people who have GED. Just as many letters in GED as there are in PhD. It's GED. true. Yep. Just as many and, letters. And there's and one, one in common. Yeah. There's one letter in common. There yeah. you go. Which one? <laughs> So let's move from brains. Moving on <laughs> to sex. Tarantulas. You guys know about spider sex. It's all about the females eating the males, right? Pretty much. So tarantulas. These big hairy spiders, right? Big hairy spiders. Researchers looked at the cannibalism, sexual cannibalism in female tarantulas because they were interested in a few specific variables of why a female would do this. Specifically, why would a female who is a virgin do it before she's had the chance to mate? Why would you do that? Why would you eat a perfectly good male if you haven't been copulated with yet and it is time to copulate? You're hungry? Foreplay? So, but you could eat See, talking about impulse control, you could eat him after you were done with him. Why would you eat him first? Right. You like dessert first? <laughs> but then there's no dinner. Anyway, the yeah. researchers from the Experimental Station of Arid Zones have studied why that would happen. They had a few ideas. Namely, they thought that if the female was very hungry, like you said, if she was very hungry, if she was malnourished, that would be the time that she would just give up and eat that male right away. And if a female was full, she would be more likely to wait 
and then eat him later. <laughs> But it turns out it might be genetic. So in order to evaluate the females, they offered randomly selected males to a group of female virgin tarantulas and documented whether they attacked the males or copulated with them. Prior to those meetings, they studied the voracious personality of the females when feeding them on beetles and other natural prey. They looked at who was more ravenous or more docile and that also uh, that made them differ in their fattening rate so if they were more ravenous they got fat quicker and then they looked at the connection between the two so they expected if they were more ravenous they ate a lot they got really fat they would be more likely to let the male mate with them turns out it's the opposite uh -huh. And so it kind of looks like it's just in their genes. If they're an aggressive female, they're an aggressive female. And if they're voracious with their food, they'll be voracious with their potential mates. There's a reason she's a virgin. <laughs> yes. She's eaten everyone who's tried to date her. I've always, an interesting thing about tarantulas too is I've always thought um, when when female spiders are cannibalistic that the male is much smaller than the female but that's not so in tarantulas. Tarantulas are about the same size as the females. Mm -hmm. The males are about the same size. So it's really interesting that they would even have the cannibalism at all and then that there would be this this super I mean maybe the super aggressiveness of some females has come from this. Mm -hmm. Yeah and so <sighs> It's just, it's really interesting that there are even still females that do this because you would think it's not evolutionarily advantageous. So I'm not sure why this still happens. Um, but still, the docile females would attack inferior males and prefer to mate with superior males. But the aggressive females would just kill males regardless of who they were. <laughs> <laughs> so they were able to distinguish males as a source of sperm or food. They couldn't figure it out. Are you sperm? Are you food? I can't tell. They and I don't care. They just cannibalized. Yep, they didn't care. So we should now not call it, the, what is it, the, the black widow? When we talk about a woman who's out to, you know, a female who kills her male mates. It's not a black widow. We're going to call her the, tarantula, the aggressive tarantula. Aggressive tarantula. <laughs> The That's voracious right. tarantula is the word the, that they use. The voracious the tarantula. That yep. is <laughs> the female serial killer. <laughs> yeah, so basically it all comes down to the tarantula's personality. I think it's absolutely crazy. They have a genetic predisposition to be voracious or docile. Wow. Yeah, pretty crazy. And so then the last invertebrate sex tidbit that I have for you which is so awesome <laughs> is that they found cave insects excuse me in Brazil and they're called neotroglas neotrogla genus neotrogla they're um, they're a cave insect and they have the opposite sex organs that the normal animals would have they have sex Question. Yeah. Question. Now, if <laughs> wait, I know what if, you're gonna ask. I think if, if they have the opposite organs, wouldn't that make them just the opposite sex? No. No. Sperm versus egg is what makes you male or female. So the animal with the eggs has a penis-like organ, and the animal with the sperm has a vaginal type opening. Wild. That's yes. that's some strange. That's some different. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the the intermittent organ, um, or you would call it the gynosome, is reversed in these guys, and they have a forty to seventy hour copulation. Wow. Yes. Wow. The females insert this penis-like organ Do they take into lunch the breaks? male. That's, I just. I mean, wow. what was it? The end of last year, beginning of beginning of this year, there was uh, an. The little rodents. 
little rodents or that were like what? Twelve to twenty-four 12 to, hours. Yeah, it was some, some oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. long period of time, but this oh. blows that out of the water. Oh, yeah. totally. Totally. Is this the longest copulation in uh, the I don't Earth? think so. So far, this is the I'll longest one I'm readily aware of. I'll look on the break. I'll get back to you after the break. But um, so oh, this is I, I'm not done with this amazing story. No, so no, no, I, I, the I, the females they insert their penis like organ into the male and then they engorge this organ and spikes stick out oh. internally to oh. anchor into the male. Oh! And at one point, these researchers attempted to pull a male and a female apart, oh, no, and a male's abdomen was ripped from the thorax yeah, no, without not, breaking the genital coupling. Oh, God. That is some strong <laughs> genital coupling. Yeah. And so they go. were looking at why, why this would happen, and they're still not 100% sure of why things are reversed in these species. All they know is that the males provide females with nutritious seminal gifts in addition to sperm, and that in these caves, nutrition and food is very hard to come by. So it's possible that the females are taking on the stereotypical male approach of sleeping with everything that they possibly can in order to get as many seminal gifts as possible to stay alive. Wow. Well, I guess this this is maybe why women aren't in charge of that. <laughs> <laughs> they got a little too far. Actually, you know, as you're saying this, I'm sort of thinking like, how far back in our ancestry was that sort of this sort of relationship formed for it to be so common? Because it seems like you could have more back and forth, more variation, I guess, uh, in sex than than we have. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah. That's a big point. It's interesting that we. There has to be a reason that this is somewhat unprecedented, and there's a picture of the insect right here on my uh, on my screen for those of you watching. But <clears throat> it's interesting that this is the only time that we've seen it, as far as we know. It's possible that it happened before and it didn't work out, and this is mm -hmm. the only time that it stuck. It's also possible this is the first time this has happened. We don't know yet. We have to look at the fossil record, but. They're still trying to figure out, they're just dying to know why. And so the best hypothesis they have so far is that nutrient bit, the seminal gifts, but really there's there's no telling yet. Um, they Their new project now is to establish a large, healthy population of these insects in a lab so that they can start studying them and experimenting to figure out exactly why. They want to look at behavior, they want to look at physiology, all of that stuff. Yeah, so little known species now suddenly becomes incredibly interesting. Yeah. Yeah, let's find out new stuff. Let's mm -hmm. figure all this out. Science. 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 Yeah, new, uh, yeah. we should call it the, 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 the Barbie bug. The Barbie bug. Why? Because <laughs> of the barbs. Of the barbs. Oh, I was picturing a Barbie doll, and I was like, that is the opposite <laughs> of that. <laughs> Actually, all right, well. It... Ken and Barbie, all things are equal. <laughs> That's not true. <laughs> not going to go any further on that one. It is time for us to take a break, so we're going to do that. This is This Week in Science. Stay with us. We'll be back in just a few moments. <laughs> Shows the way to go. 
Audible.com is the leading provider of audiobooks with more than 150,000 titles in their library. And we here at Twist know that you will find at least one great science book in their library that you will love listening to. So why don't you head on over to audiblepodcast.com slash twist. This web address will allow you to get one free audiobook download of your choice. They're not going to tell you what to download, but just for signing up, trying out their service, you'll get one free audiobook download. You pick it, you listen to it, you enjoy it, and maybe you'll stay a customer. That's what they're betting on. So, in the process, you're going to get a free audiobook download. We're going to get a little bit of a kickback for you trying it out, and maybe Audible finds a new customer who enjoys their service for the rest of your life. Who knows? Right now, audiblepodcast.com slash twist, T-W-I. Twist also has merchandise for you to enjoy. Head on over to our website, twist.org, and look for our Zazzle store. It's in the main header bar um, over at twist.org. And if you go there and click on the Zazzle store link, you'll be able to check out our hats, sweatshirts, stamps, aprons, duffel little bag things, all sorts of swag with the Twist logo emblazoned all over it that you can share Wear and share twists with the world. Start conversations. People will go, what is that? What's twists? And you'll go, mm, let me tell you about twists. Let me tell you something. Twist is supported by listeners like you. Your donations pay for our hosting, our bandwidth, fun things we like to do, contractors we need to hire, you know, all the stuff that goes into maintaining something like this. And we appreciate any amount that you are able to give. If it's $2, if it's $200,000, it's, you know, Maybe a pipe dream of mine, but if it is, that's wonderful. Whatever it is, it's wonderful. You make this show possible in every little amount that you're able to give. We accept donations in two ways. We currently have PayPal buttons all over our website, so if you use PayPal, you can go to our website, twist.org, and look for the PayPal buttons everywhere. Show page, front page, wherever. Uh, second, we've started a Patreon account, and Patreon is kind of like Kickstarter for media producers, where you will be able to support us per episode produced, and then be uh, for a certain amount, and then be charged at the end of each month for how many episodes of the show that we produce, how and however much you've decided to support us, and you get a gift from us to thank you for your support. It's all all part of it. So, patreon.com slash thisweekinscience is the web address if you would like to support us through Patreon. And uh, what else is there? Yeah, patreon.com slash thisweekinscience. And whatever your preference, though, go to our website, and there are links and everything, and go to the most recent episode, comment, and make a donation. If you can't afford a donation, however, I'm always talking about things related to money. If you can't afford something like that, uh, we still appreciate you as a listener, and you still have a big part of are a big part of this community in keeping the show going and helping it to grow. So, if you have a social network, if you're on Twitter, if you're fa on Facebook, if you see people at cafes or at school or at work during the day, why don't you just start a conversation? Tell somebody about Twist today and help us grow our audience. That would be one of the most amazing things that you could do. Tell people to tune into Twists and help science. We thank you for your support. We couldn't do this without you. And we're back with more This Week in Science. What? What? Yes, what stories you got? There's more. There's Justin? More. Yeah. Rats! Rats! Radiated. Rats radiated with high energy particles simulating the exposure a space traveler would experience on a deep space voyage showed lapses in attention and reduced reaction times. The rats showed these impairments even when the radiation was in extremely low doses. 
this was a John Hopkins scientists uh, that were working on this report, that the cognitive impairments, which affected a large subset, but not all of the animals, it was like 40 to 45 percent of them, appeared to be linked to protein changes in the brain. Uh, found to hold true in humans, it suggests it may be possible to develop a biological marker to uh, predict the sensitivity to radiation's effects on spacefarers, uh, brains before they deploy to deep space missions. It also might have some implications on radiation treatments which patients may or may not have uh, side effects, I guess, uh, cognitive side effects resulting from radiation treatments. It's interesting. This is, a, it's a, this is funded by NASA. It's in the April issue of the journal Radiation Research. So when, whenever an astronaut leaves the Earth's protective magnetic field, the spaceship that they're in has some shielding from radiation exposure, but it's somewhat limited to. It can only go so far. Uh, they then, if they go out on any spacewalks, do any, you know, planetary walkabouts, they get the full effects of radiation from anything that's out there. Solar flares, intergalactic cosmic rays, uh, and in this case, if you were thinking about landing on the moon or Mars, which do not have a planet-wide protective magnetic field, the astronauts there would ex be exposed to the high-end radiation levels uh, when, they're, when they're on the surface. Not just the spacewalks, but even on the surface of these planets. This is uh, Phobos, one of the moons of Mars. I've seen talked about by NASA as being a potential spot for like a human-based observatory of Mars. Right. Because it's got Mars, Mars's gravity isn't as great as Earth's. This moon is very, very, very small. And compared to ours, they even think it may be a captured, uh, captured asteroid. Hmm. It's got a very close, uh, close orbit. It's also tidally locked, so it's the same side is always facing Mars. And that and that would make it really, that's what really makes it great for uh, an observatory location. That's one. The other side of it, though, yeah. is it's dense enough uh, mm -hmm. to create a shield from the radiation of space. So you, you wouldn't need as much shielding, radiation shielding, uh, on an, at an observatory there than you would stay down on the surface of Mars. Interesting. So it's got a couple, of, couple of interesting. Yeah, the thing that the thing that I find really interesting about the uh, the rat study for this is that um, you know that it's just a small percentage of the rats that were affected by the radiation, well, and that it's good. not all of them, and that the it's pretty good. It's forty to forty-five percent. It's a pretty good percentage. It's a good percentage, but it's still yeah. not all. So but that means that all. that half at half to two thirds of the uh, the population of rats, and if it's the same in humans, astronauts, um, have differences in their dopamine transport system that are significant enough that they're not going to be affected. What are those differences? And do those differences here on Earth, not even related to radiation and astronauts, do those differences here on Earth have anything to do with um, degenerative diseases and dysfunction? Well, later they, in life. So I think that there are a lot of different areas of research here that this is going to spin into that are totally interesting. Right. I mean, it, it'll have also a biological... If they're, they're trying to see if it has an identifiable biological or genetic marker, that similarity that you could, you know, tell an astronaut early on in his career, space station, okay, you're not, you're not wired for the Mars mission. You know, but I, w I wonder also if it is something like it's dopamine transport, so maybe there is something uh, related to attention or attention deficit disorder, and maybe it's the 40 or 45 percent of people who would never become astronauts because they can't concentrate enough anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so we don't even have to worry about it. <laughs> My dopamine transport is, is so defective or highly operational, whichever the case may be, 
Yeah. That I'd make a perfect candidate for deep space if I could run <laughs> if I could well enough. Just <laughs> pay attention long enough. <laughs> What's also interesting here, um, so some some of the rats affected, uh, but some of them were totally unaffected, right? So some of them started showing. They started showing the weeks, the effects, uh, like several weeks, seven weeks after the exposure. Once impaired. They never went away. Those impairments never ceased. For there were some, though, there were some that did show an improvement over time. So there, <laughs> they, there may be a way to recover from this, and they're going to delve into that because some, a, a very small percentage of the rats did recover from the impairment, but hmm. most of them who were impaired didn't. It didn't go away in the time nice. span, at least of the study. Right. So. Um, so this could be some serious, uh, some serious stuff. They're 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 also talking about maybe you know, hey, look, this doesn't necessarily rule out an astronaut's ability to go into space. It's possible that they could develop a helmet that was you know better tuned, or maybe a drug you could take that would resist the effects. Uh, this is just opening up the the discovery. It is just opening up this this line of inquiry. Yeah, so much interesting stuff there. Microbes? Mm -hmm. Shall we discuss microbes? I have three studies here, and I know Justin's got one as well, but we are microbed up for the next few minutes here. Uh, researchers in New York City at New York University sampled $81 bills from a Manhattan bank. Researchers have done this before, and they've found all sorts of things in dollar bills. We know money is dirty, right? Mm -hmm. Those dollar bills you, you, you handle, hand to people, not clean. This study confirms that even more. Uh, doing genetic analysis of, uh, of what they could find on the bills, they found more than 3,000 bacterial types, um, many drug-resistant species, and yes. uh, the known, the interesting percentage here is that only 20% of those 3,000 types were, were known bacteria or known microbes. Only 20% were known. The rest were unyet, uh, completely unidentified species. So there is a wow. huge world of little tiny stuff that's just hanging out on us in our dollar bills, and we have no idea. We, I mean, we could identify 20% of what was there. We just know there is a lot there because of the genes. Um, yeah, so the most, an, another interesting thing, the most abundant species they identified were those that cause acne, and then uh, second to that, followed by benign skin flora. So I'm going to guess that uh, the bacteria that cause acne, what we are are often told not to touch our face with our hands, probably carry those Don't bacteria. Don't rub money on, on your hands. face. Don't rub money on your face. Yeah. <laughs> right, That's Justin. Just, mm. <laughs> and of course, you always touch food or touch money right before you touch food a lot of the time. Oh, right. Yeah. Maybe. I never think of that. Maybe just try and. Clean your hands before you eat food. Should you just carry <laughs> tweezers and like open up your wallet and use <laughs> tweezers to hand yeah, money? Maybe, you they, wouldn't be looked at weird at all, right? Yeah, the researchers did say that many wallets, a lot of people, not not women so much, but men very often carry their wallets on their bodies in their pockets, which uh, leads the leads the wallets to be really great uh, little incubators for bacteria. So because they're going to be almost at body temperature if not at body temperature um, and in a nice little dark pocket until you decide to use it. So you might think about the material that, you're, that you have in your wallet and um, where you carry your wallet well, if my, you want my to wallet reduce the bacteria. <laughs> in, my my wallet's pretty sterile. Yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty much a clean zone. I yeah. have been cash in my wallet and I don't know how long. <laughs> But <laughs> no, but I use no honestly because I use I use plastic for everything now. I don't I know, like, yeah. never have cash. Like when somebody you go somewhere and it requires cash, you're like ah, I guess I'm not doing that. <laughs> right. Yeah, and it actually might be might be good to be moving away from cash 
uh, or to move away from cash because the researchers highlight uh, the issue uh, of the likelihood that mm -hmm. cash can be a vector for spreading disease and that it could, um, you know, cash distributed internationally, money that you take out over here and carry overseas um, or vice versa, uh, will end up taking the bacteria or mm. viruses that are held on it to whatever place that you go. So, so that's a good reason death. to not accept American dollars at their places, I suppose. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's. Uh, I guess it's only a little while until we have that like barcode on our arm and we just scan it whenever scan we it. pay for anything. How many scan credits? Or, or start. Or start just monitoring currency exchanges. Yeah. <laughs> Next outbreak. Yep. Just keep watching where the money's going, and then you'll know. You will know. Um, people, researchers also in a different study looked at uh, the composition of people's microbiomes as adults and tried to determine what would lead to what influences would lead to those population makeups like where they would come from and you know being born c-section versus vaginally that's one issue another is breastfeeding whether or not you were breastfeeding is going to affect your uh, your microbiota but the 300 healthy people they analyzed at 18 different body sites and that's different sites on their bodies. Um, and then even additional samples beyond that found that specific aspects of human life history um, really have an influence. And one is that you might not consider is level of education. So yeah. depending on what your level of education is, is going to determine what microbes are on you. Um, your gender is going to have an influence, whether you're male or female. Um, other uh, other things are whether or not you've had certain illnesses, um, uh, wealth and social status. So social factors can also affect uh, your your microbes. Hmm. Kind of int kind of interesting. And it um, they found looking at this that the the microbes in the mouth varied the most, whereas uh, microbes in the gut and the vagina stayed very stable and didn't change that much. So tracking these individuals over more than a year, they were able to see that, okay, gut stays fairly consistent, vagina fairly consistent, the mouth, that's changing a lot and um, probably has a lot to do with what food you're eating and all, who you're kissing, mm -hmm. maybe. But Wait, that would mean you were kissing lots of different people. What? Some people do. Or or does that in indicate that somewhere between the mouth and the gut there's a filter? Yes, that that's says, it's, there's beyond something. this point you shall not pass. Yes. Thou shall not pass. Yeah. Um and in my and I final assume that, I assume that most never I can't <laughs> And you and you put a lot more variety of things in your mouth. I'll just <laughs> Okay, and the final, <laughs> the final microbe story that I have has to do with dairy cows, who we've talked about before. A new study reported in MBio, uh, which is an open access journal for the American Society of Microbiology, uh, finds a bunch of genes in cow manure. They found a bunch of antibiotic resistance genes in cow manure. But before we jump and go, ah, antibiotic resistance in cows, uh, most of them is that uh, most of these genes um, are not related to humans at all, and they are simply related to um, the lifestyle of the cows, and the antibiotic resistance is specific to the antibiotics that the cows have been fed. Um, so, so another reason, reason to not give cows antibiotics. It is a reason not to. So at this point in time, according or according to this, um, the researchers say there the desert, diversity of genes we found is remarkable in itself, considering the small set of five manure samples. But also 
These are evolutionarily distant from the genes we already have in the genetic databases, which largely represent antibiotic resistance genes that we see in the clinic. So, cow gut bacteria not causing problems for humans for the most part based on these five samples that they looked at, very small samples. But there's a lot of these genes for antibiotic resistance and what the, what the concern is and where future studies are going to be looking is at whether or not uh, horizontal gene transfer, which is the actual transfer of genes from one bacteria sitting next to another bacteria going, hey, you want my genes? Sure, I'll take your genes. And suddenly you've got antibiotic resistance genes in bacteria who did not have them before because of this horizontal transfer between individuals. And so that is what the concern is, that uh, eventually we could see the transfer of these genes because there are so many of them into bacteria who do come in contact, which do come in contact uh, with humans, um, and that could cause problems. So, yeah, as you said, Blair, with this antibiotics for cows, it's not going any good places as far as we can tell. Well, when you think about antibiotics for humans, would you take antibiotics if you weren't sick? No, never. Nope. And this is exactly why. But we feed these antibiotics to the cows oh, yeah, whether mixed or into not. Their food. Yeah, it's just it's just in the food. Just every you get antibiotics and you get antibiotics and you get antibiotics. Of course this is going to happen. Totally agree. Totally agree. So that's my uplifting microbe news for this week. <laughs> Justin? <laughs> so uh, this was kind of interesting. We've heard about the hygiene hypothesis for why there's a greater amount of asthma, allergies, inflammatory disorders among people who live in cities, but specifically people who live in the sort of lower socioeconomic uh, aspect of our big cities. And the studies thing, it might be due in part to reduced exposure to microbes that are in rural environments. So it's sort of taking a twist. I know we've talked before on the show a few times about how people can tend to have more allergies if they haven't been exposed to animals or to wildlife or to fauna, right? Yeah. And, and they're saying, yeah, they, they think there is definitely a link. Uh, but the, the sort of aspect is it's not just about being too clean. It's not just that you're in the city and you're washing your hands too much and being exposed to too few microbes. Uh, but then it's actually linked in this, the way they're looking at it, socioeconomic, because the idea is wealthier people take vacations where they go camping, where they go to the beach, where they get the, the kids run around and get their you know bare feet touching dirt. Uh, and this exposure to microbes may be creating the beneficial effects down the road. Whereas if you're in a city environment or clean environment where you're not spending some of your time in a rural setting, you're not getting any exposure to what has traditionally evolutionarily been something our immune system tolerated and was used to exposing itself to. Hmm. Yeah. They say this would explain why low-income urban residents who cannot easily afford to take the city to leave the city for rural vacations are those more likely to suffer from inflammatory diseases. Uh, it's made worse because people who live in the densely populated areas are also more likely to come into contact with crowd infections, which then cause more inflammation. Uh, if you if you have some exposure to benign microbes your body gets a little bit better about tolerating microbial loads and is less likely to overreact with an inflammation that it doesn't need. Nice. But just, makes sense. just if you do go out into the rural areas, though, uh, footnote, uh, mind the cow patties. <laughs> yeah, mind the cow patties. I think that's a good footnote for this story. Um, as we've seen Blair yawning a little bit earlier, and I'm coming into this, I'm like... <sighs> okay, a little bit of yawning here. Um, so I have a couple of stories about some alternate hypotheses for why things happen. Um, 
the there are some man researchers. Copy of the X-Files. No. <laughs> yeah. Uh, some researchers publishing. Uh, where have they published this thing? I'm not seeing the link here. Mm, let me see. Where is this published? Pu Physiolog physiology of behavior. A thermal window for yawning in humans. Yawning as a brain cooling mechanism. What? Yes. Yes. So, the most recent idea as to why we yawn uh, is that maybe it's because our brain is hot and needs to cool down. <laughs> I've never heard anything more ridiculous. <laughs> so these researchers looked at 120 pedestrians who were sampled for their susceptibility to self-report yawn contagion during summer and winter. So where winter it's cold and summer it's hot. And the self -re and so the temperature was the only thing that was um, the only thing that was linked. Pedestrians reported yawning was lower in the winter than in the summer. But I think there are some conflicting factors here in this particular study. If they're self-reporting, they're not actually measuring how many yawns people are doing at mm -hmm. a particular time. They're just getting what people say. Mm -hmm. And there could also be the, hey, in winter it's dark longer, so maybe people are just going to bed and getting more mm -hmm. sleep. Mm -hmm. than in the summer when it's light all the time if you are in a place where it's not equatorial. Yeah. I know I feel more tired when I've been in the heat all day, too. Well, yeah, and he takes San it out of you. I mean, you're used to, you've got a natural climate there that's cooler. So maybe it's more exhausting for you to find. Uh, whenever, you're out of your, whenever you're out of your normal temperature range. You mm. expend energy getting back. So yes. in the super hot or the super cold, you're going to use more calories and you're going right. to metabolize more calories. This is yeah. self-reporting data on something that I don't know how they did it. Look, uh, yeah, so where, basically what where, they're do saying you blink is that more in the winter in the or summer, the summer? Yeah, but what they're saying, <laughs> maybe you blink no. more in the summer. I don't know. You're, yeah, you're, wow, because it's brighter or it's something. It's bright. Like, maybe ah, if it's dry, cooling. if you're in a dry heat kind of place, you drink, you, you blink more because your eyes are so dry. You're just losing water out your eyeballs. I don't know. But basically the more. idea here is that they think yawning could be related to brains being hotter, body temperatures rising, in the summer months more often and so leading to oh yeah I'm gonna be more susceptible to a yawn because my body temperature is just a little bit higher and my brain wants to is Doctor, gonna be triggered Doctor, to cool you, down can I self-report something yes I tend to yawn more at night when it's cooler <laughs> than when it's during the day I yawn more when I'm tired here it goes again we're talking about it <laughs> <laughs> Stop that. I'm not even sleepy. Just every time one of you yawns, I get this like, like I just visceral like blooming happens. I, I'm gonna I, I'm go, I'm gonna self report something here myself. Every time I see a yawning she, story, I'm going to report it because it's just so fun. <laughs> even reading the word yawn makes me yawn. Right? It's pretty yeah. awesome. But maybe if we it were more winter, <laughs> yeah. you would not be so susceptible. Because it's it's spring now, officially. So I have no idea what, what season it is. California <laughs> already went through spring, then winter came again. Then it was fall. I got there's a tree out front that's Oh got yeah, it's not winter anymore, so now we can say it. New <laughs> leaves and yellowing leaves that are about to drop. <laughs> it's, it's such a confused tree. I feel so sorry for it. it like I, it, it gave up on us already. <laughs> it's like leave me alone. Okay, my other alternative hypothesis, hypothesis story: um, an evolutionary biologist at the University of New South Wales named Margot Adler has published a piece on her idea for why calorie restriction works to ex extend lifespan. And um, her idea is that. Um, uh, that wild animals, so you've got all these animals that 
if you take it to the evolutionary perspective, calorie restriction would exist during times of famine and food scarcity. So why during periods of famine and food scarcity would your body upregulate and start making fixing things and making you more healthy? Um, and so in, in what she says is the problem is that wild animals don't have the long, secure lives of their laboratory cousins. Instead, they're not only endangered by famine, but by predators, pathogens, all sorts of stuff, physiological threats, there's all sorts of stuff. And she says that um, the, the end thing is that you got to keep going and you have to reproduce and you can't wait to reproduce until foods, food supplies are more plentiful. Um, you just have to reproduce now. And the previous ideas about caloric restriction say that natural selection favors the switch from reproduction to survival. So animals are going to have more young in the long run so long as they survive. So there's this, the old idea is that, okay, you restrict calories, you're not going to reproduce, but you're going to survive so you make your body stronger. And then you can reproduce later. But she's like, why is that going to work? Because you could die any day. So you should reproduce now. You should always reproduce now. Um, and so I don't, think, I don't think always either. And that's what other researchers are saying as well, is that uh, animals that have different amounts of parental care, longer periods of, of parental re rearing of young um, is a huge risk uh, for them to have offspring during famine. So it would really not be a good idea if you're like a human to have a baby during a period of famine or for your body to be planning on doing that. Um, so anyway, the fact that we see caloric restriction work in every species we, we've tested it on so far suggests it's something that's evolutionarily conserved regardless of what our, um, our reproduction strategies are what, what different species reproductive strategies are currently. Um, so anyway, her idea is that reproduce now. Uh, she hypothesizes that during a, uh, that it holds that during a famine, animals escalate cellular repair, repair and recycling. They do so for the purpose of having as many kids as possible during a famine and not afterwards, making the best of a bad situation, maximizing their current present fitness, and uh, she says it's an efficiency mode that the animal goes into. So some people agree, some people disagree, but it works for caloric restriction works for everybody. And it's a new hype. It's a new idea on why it works. So cool. Yeah. I had to turn off the uh, the chat room or get the, move the screen away because people were writing the word yawn. <laughs> and I had like seven in a row. It's, it's ridiculous. That's awesome. Do you guys have any uh, quick stories? I'm done. No blurbs? Uh, tons of quick stuff going on. Uh, this was a quick one. They're working on, may have already developed, according to this, a night vision, a night vision, not a goggle, not a, but a contact lens. Ah! That allows awesome. you to see in the dark. Has some thermal. That is energy. so cool. I want it. I wonder, I I wonder want that. If it would, I wonder if it would work on me, you guys. Night vision contact lens. I want night vision contact lenses, and then I want to go play capture the flag out in Golden Gate Park. Right here, the scientists at the University of Michigan's College of Engineering have invented a room temperature light sensor that doesn't require heavy cooling equipment to function. And they think, hey, we could be, we could be doing this. What? That's, That's cool. really cool. No goggles, just lenses. Also, uh, if you uh, are trying to be more creative in whatever it is that you do, you should, according to the this little study here from American Psychological Association, uh, or published in the uh, American Psychological Association, published by them, take a walk. Don't try to think creatively sitting still. Get up, stretch, go for a walk. Uh, you, 100% uh, of students tested did 100% better. 100% came up with more creative ideas in one experiment. 
And the other studies were 95, 88, 81 percent came up with more creative ideas uh, after taking a walk than they had just sitting there. That's great. I know I, you hear about it all the time, scientists coming up with the answer to some theorem, the, you know, the, the creative design for an experiment on how to, how to test something when they're out walking, when they're out doing something different, or when you're taking a shower, or it's, it's when you take your brain off of whatever it is that you're trying to do, get yourself out of your box, relax, de-stress, exercise, blood flow. The yeah. shower is oh, oh, my oh. best brainstorming time for sure. Yeah. Driving, going for long drives. Mm -hmm. Oh, driving. Driving is, is a good one. I like driving. Long drive down Highway 1. That's a good oh, one. Like mm. Yeah. Um, you guys hear about there are, there are these sounds. There are a few of them, these sounds that emanate from the deep ocean. Mysteries. Are... Science will never solve the deep sea Ocean mystery sounds. And except that they solved one. Wait, what? Yeah. So uh, in the 1960s, there was a sound. It's like this weird deep sea quack. The hum sound. of the alien generators for their city under the city under the sea. No, it's mink whales, and so what? these researchers yeah. now that they have um, have bio tags on these whales, they're actually tracking the whales, and they were watching these whales and listening to their sounds as they were going down. And they're like, "Oh, hey, what's that sound? Oh, that's that sound. Oh, hey," yeah. and they're like, "Mink whales. They're producing this deep sea whale quack sound that has been confusing submarine operators for." about, you know, since the 1960s. Wow. Mink whales are so cute. Yeah, they're... They Let's call cute. them minky whales. The minkies, the minkies. The mink whales, yeah. There's a minky and so, whale and they were, right here. Nice. And the researchers were saying the best thing about this is that since uh, you know, undersea sounds have been recorded and there are these logs of sounds from research for so long where it, they have these sounds but they haven't they didn't know what they were now that they've identified where it's coming from that it's the mink whales they can now go back through data to be able to to learn stuff about the mink whales at certain places and times where the recordings have been made so there's actually the potential for a lot of information to come out of this now that they know that it's these whales that have been making this sound mm. yeah uh, there's also the world's longest running experiment well, like Ooh. official science experiment. It's this pitch, pitch sap, really, you know, deep, tarry substance that's basically a solid. People consider it a solid, this pitch stuff. Um, back in 1927, 1927, 19, yeah, 1927 or 1923, something like that, uh, this experiment was set up where they put the pitch sap in a, in a little thing going upside down and let it start dripping out and they on average one drip of this pitch comes out every 13 years hmm. so they get like when it comes out it comes out and and the moment's gone um, until recently they didn't have the modern technology to like actually make sure that a camera was trained on it at the right moment in time or that a person was there so they've missed all of them this was the ninth drop of pitch that just dropped they had like three video cameras on it, digital cameras, to make sure that it would be captured in in digital posterity. Um, yeah, so we have seen this ninth drop of pitch drop onto the eighth pitch drop, and it was really slow motion, but we saw it. Yeah, the story is actually kind of sad where... Um, the researchers who have been watching over this experiment over the years, you know, they've missed it on some occasions by like five minutes. You know, just like they were there and it was going to happen. They're like, oh, it's not going to happen. They left the room, they came back, and it happened. <laughs> that was their data point. You know, this is such a long-running experiment because the data is not happening all the Wait, time. How long has this been going on? Like 114 years. So this is this is actually. And this is the first data point. This is research torture. Yeah. yeah. This is okay. You, this what, is what, research what's the project torture. you're going to be working on? All right, just follow me. It's in this room. Stare at that. Don't look away. 
Don't I have to find out. Oh, you missed it. What? Oh. <laughs> that will happen again in 10, 20 years. Exactly. Oh, my uh, goodness. I have a couple things that I just remembered. If you're... What? Yeah. I had I had one more, but... Um, Go ahead. Go. NASA's Lady mission to the moon finished with an unobserved impact on the far side of the moon last week. A uh, lady mission, if you do not know what it was, functioned to study the atmosphere of the moon, the lunar atmosphere. And it didn't have enough c fuel to continue orbiting the moon indefinitely, so they just crashed it into the moon. And they think it, they think, they don't actually know because they crashed it on the far side of the moon. They think that it, like, pulverized, that phew, vaporized, that the majority of it's gone. But they don't know. We'll find out. We shall. We shall. What were your stories, Blair? So first of all, I wanted to follow up on the longest copulation. I did a little bit of research, and you guys can feel free, feel free to tweet at us about it or email me if I'm incorrect. But as far as I can tell, the longest one that I could find recorded on the Internet was a pair of rattlesnakes that were recorded at 23 hours. So, wait, wait, but, that's, but your bug was longer. Yeah, so the bug was much longer. Wow. Than the insect. Wow. Yeah, the insect was 40 to 70 hours. So that might be the longest. But is it really copulation? Because now, now I'm thinking about it with the with Well, the they're connected, and they're, tr and they're connected, and they're... Yeah, they're, they're not, the sexual they, sex there are been, lots of male like, genitalia that have minutes. hooks and barbs and those kinds of things where they're stuck for a very long time. In fact, yeah, it's true. Dog copulation: the male's uh, organ engorges and the female is stuck attached to the male. In dogs, um, and then the quick uh, headline that isn't I isn't that just awkward because at that point, you know, it's over. But right, they're stuck. Like, yeah. Well, so but it's what still it's still about? part of the, it's still part we're, of the process. There's we're gonna, still the coffee. We're gonna be there for a the, while. So it's part of the process oh because you've got the um, first the okay we're gonna actually decide that we are are trading trading egg and semen or whatever. Trading information. We're trading information, and so you're gonna have that process of getting together, making it happen. Right. That trade will happen, and then sometimes there's just the just holding on and being there to protect your investment, mm -hmm. to make sure that no other male or female is gonna come around and take over and have their sperm be the next sperm in and actually win. You know, there's this whole competition there, aspect. So that could be part of, of why stuck. it's such a long, yeah. For 40 to 70, 70 hours, hours, which, hours where it's which like, you'd think would be uh, not advantageous. Right. <laughs> I, I really, you know, I've got errands to run. Can, is it possible that we could go together like this? Is it <laughs> we made a few stops? Because I got, I know I didn't think ahead of it. I I really got to pay this one bill here, and I promised so and so we'd go to lunch together. So, you want to come right. along? Because yeah, I um, hear. I, I was gonna say, I think maybe this this insect might only be competing against um, sting from the. Right, no, well, <laughs> oh, yeah. not much else in there. <laughs> but no, because it's it's a, like it's in this cave, right? It's this little trogla bug. Mm -hmm. And then speaking of. Uh, intense copulation uh, situations. Uh, just a quick headline from the news, something that, that uh, kind of perked my interest, is that uh, facial hair for men might be on the way out. Yes. Uh, that's because uh, in a study where they qualify or quantified men's and women's judgments of attractiveness, health, masculinity, and parenting abilities on photographs of men who are clean shaven, lightly or heavily stubbled and fully bearded. They looked at um, when there were mostly bearded or varieties of bearded men shown, the women picked the clean shaven men as the most attractive. And when there were mostly clean shaven men, they picked the bearded men as the most attractive. So now that beards are in and most men have beards, yeah. they will start getting selected back out again and most likely will get a wave of clean shavenness again. Wait, clean shavenness went away? Yeah, somebody, yeah, I, I'm somebody sorry, please tell the hipsters in San Francisco. I didn't notice. Because. 
I know. I can't tell my true bearded men from the men who are just growing beard for fun. Any dude who's got a beard, I assume he's a barista. Is that, In San is that, Francisco, that you just assume they are a coder of some kind. Yep. They, <laughs> they're going to work for Facebook or Yahoo. or. I have bearded friends. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, beards may be on the way up. And I think, you know, this is also one of these studies that's got to be Western-oriented. I mean, in, in Asia, there's not a whole lot of bearding going on in the first place. In the Middle East, I think there's, you know, bearding is the norm. I, I think, I don't know. I think that's, it just, that's a very popular It just goes, it, it goes back to a very basic biological concept, which I didn't want to make novelty? this a whole big thing. No, but this but is now going to be a big thing. Justin will help do. you make this a big thing. This is what we Novelty here. is important. Think about right. the peacock. Yes. Right? That's basically what that is, is I am the most unusual, and despite my unusualness, I have survived. That means I am very fit. Yes. But the chick doesn't even look. The chick peacock doesn't even look at the amazing display. She's it's, looking at his she feet. She did. Remember, she looks at girth, not height. That's oh, right. The width. The width. Yeah. How wide is it? Not yeah. how long. So there's, so there's a peacock out there who happens to have really long feathers, but is missing the whole top layer. It's just all, it's all, he's like a bald, he's a bald peacock. He's bald on the top, but he's got like sideburns, and he still uh -huh. can get the ladies. Right, but David then... Grizzly Smith, I was going to say, David Grizzly Smith from, who, who might be a, a, a grizzly man, I don't know, uh, from our QA on, on Google Plus says, clean-shaven men look younger perhaps, causing them to seem more attractive as reproductive partners. Maybe. Maybe, um, but when clean-shaven is the norm, the bearded men are seen as more attractive. So basically it's right. whatever's not around... Whatever is unusual in a sample is what gets the ladies' attention, which is probably true the other way too. If you're in a, if I was in a room full of blondes, I would stick out. Um, you would, yes. Yeah. That's just how it works. Yeah, but if you were, if you were, if you were the only lady in a room with a beard, I don't know if it would help you. I shouldn't <laughs> try that. <laughs> I was gonna. Now I won't. I don't know. I don't know if that would. I don't know if that would help your chances. Okay. All right. All right. I think anyway. that. I think we have. We've done it. We've more than done it. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> again. Doing it and doing it again and again and again every week on This Week in Science. And now it's time for me to give a few shout-out thank yous to people who are supporting us on Patreon. So here we go with the list, everybody. Thank you very much to Kevin Donald Wesley Ballard, Zach, Bo Hartwig, Gary Williamson, Jason Dozier, Matthew Litwin, Eric Knapp, Jason Roberts, Patrick Cohn, Shane and Tara Ginsberg, Brian Condren, Brian Lee, EO, Ulysses Adkins, Jared Lysette, Paul D. Disney, Bob Calder, Don Komarechka, Jonathan Kelly, Edgar, Tony Steele, Ed Dyer, Marshall Clark, Layla Amir Sadegi, Nick Gradwell, Adam Mishkan, Nick Craig Porter, Alec Doty, Dan Rambo, Philip Atherton, TMRO, Ben Rothig, Gary Swinberg, Swinsberg, Jeff Peterson, Jason Martin, Miko Pakola, John Specht, Dougal Campbell, Larry Garcia, Tyler Harris, and Jurgen Stellingwerf, Philip Shane, Charlene Davidson, Henry, and Marjorie. Thank you very much for your support. And I have other things to say as well. Uh, next week's show, we'll be broadcasting live online again, 8 p.m. Pacific time on twist.org slash live, where you can watch and join our chat room. And don't worry, if you can't make it, you can find our past episodes on youtube.com slash thisweekinscience or twist.org for the audio versions. And don't forget to tell a friend about Twist. And check out our Patreon page, patreon.com slash thisweekinscience. Thank you, everyone, for listening. We hope you enjoyed the show. Twist is also available as a podcast. Just Google This Week in Science in your iTunes directory. Or if you have a mobile device, you can look for Twist for Droid app in the Android Marketplace or Twist, T-W-I-S, in the Apple Marketplace. 
For more information on anything you've heard here today, show notes will be available on our website, www.twist.org, that's T-W-I-S dot O-R-G, where you can also make comments and start conversations with the hosts and other listeners. You can also contact us directly. Email Kirsten at Kirsten at thisweekinscience.com, Justin at twistminion at gmail.com, or Blair at blairbaz at twist.org. Be sure to put twists in the subject line or your email will get spam filtered into oblivion. You can also hit us up on the Twitter where we are at Twist Science, at Dr. Kiki, at Jackson Fly, and at Blair's Menagerie. We love your feedback. If there's a topic you would like us to cover or address, a suggestion for an interview, please let us know. We'll be back here next week, and we hope you'll join us again for some more great science news. And if you've learned anything from today's show, <laughs> remember... It's all in your head. This Week in Science. This Week in Science. This Week in Science. This week in science, it's the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. This week science is coming your way. So everybody listen to what I say. I use the scientific method for all that it's worth. And I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth. Cause it's this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 I've got one disclaimer and it shouldn't be news. That what I say may not represent your views. But I've done the calculations and I've got a plan. If you listen to the science, you may just yet understand that we're not trying to threaten your philosophy. We're just trying to save the world from jeopardy. Jeopardy, jeopardy. And this week in science is coming your way. So everybody listen to everything we say. And if you use our methods instead of rolling a die, we may rid the world of toxoplasma. Got the eye. Aye, 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 aye. Cause it's this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 I've got a laundry list of items I want to address From stopping global hunger to dredging Loch Ness I'm trying to promote more rational thought And I'll try to answer any question you've got But how can I ever see the changes I seek When I can only set up shop one hour a week? This week in science is coming your way You better just listen to what we say And if you've learned anything from the words that we've said Then please just remember it's all in your head Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science Science, 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 science. science. This week in science This week in science this week in science, 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 this week in 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 science. And now it's time for the post show, the post show, the post show. Now it's time for the post show. Don't go away. I sang a song. What if I go away? <laughs> yeah, no. If you want to, 
go away. It's fine. <laughs> Thank you for watching, everybody. Um, I was going to ask if we can set up a mailing party sure. next week, maybe. That sounds great. That would be awesome. Yeah, I gotta mail out some patches and t-shirts and stuff. And you know what? Mm. Do you know what, Blair? Mm. According to Patreon, mm -hmm. you you need to draw one picture for seven. Yes. Weeks. Okay. There can I is. have that person's email address, and I'll email them and ask them a couple questions, and then I'll draw it. Yes. Yes, I will send that to you right now. Great. Mm -hmm. Well, mm. do actually do I need to do two because somebody pledged above that too? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So That's I need. Right. So yeah. if you can send me both of those email addresses, I'll email them mm -hmm. and ask them about some details. Um, just so I'm not working blind. Awesome. Let's see. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there's that. And then was there anything else? Oh, um, and next Thursday, I emailed you. I emailed you guys like probably a few weeks ago to warn mm -hmm. you all. But next Thursday, I will not be here. What? what? When did this happen? Okay. Way to spring this on us at the last minute. Psh. <laughs> I guess sent an email out like forever ago. That's fine. We got it. You're allowed to take a night off. So I guess that means I'm in charge. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> you want to be in charge, Justin? Go ahead. We'll have fun. We'll have fun. Yeah. We have who, who's gonna? Who's... Somebody has. Somebody has to decide they're in charge. <laughs> I think Blair just did. <laughs> All right, Justin's in charge. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Um. Yeah, no, it'll be, it'll be. Yeah, Justin's in charge. <laughs> why are you, why are you, why are you laughing at this proposition? That's a pretty funny laugh too. It's like evil laugh. Mwahahaha. <laughs> 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 Justin's in charge. <laughs> this is something that should be intuitive. <laughs> this is, of course, of course, obviously. Obviously, it's a hierarchy, right? Hey, uh, yeah. Yeah. He's a figurehead. I'm happy horse, with that. Of course. Now, we're going to have to, we're actually going to have to talk at some point before uh, we we try to do that to figure out who says what and does mm -hmm. what in, mm -hmm. in terms of things that are said. Resetting right. up the template. Because we, we become mm -hmm. such, such a formulaic <laughs> So. At least in our Uber structure, if not in our content. Um, you won't know how to go back to doing it. You won't know how to do anything I don't else. know how to free flow anymore. I, I don't, I think I don't it's, know. I, I think it'll be fine. <laughs> yeah. I think we'll do okay. I hope we do all right. So as long as we still get our stories in on Wednesday. <laughs> I thought it was Thursday. We get our what stories in on Wednesday. Okay. And then... Um, we just have to divvy up Kiki's parts of things that are said. And I always do the show break when she's not there. It's like not a big deal. Yeah. Yeah, and I will I'll make I'll make sure that I make a new run sheet. I'll do it right now. Okay. What about music? What's the deal with that? Oh, we won't have any. Yeah. Basically we won't have any, which is always weird. Yeah. Can I play it on another speaker or something? Justin, what did you do the one time that you got music to play? How did you do that? Did you get another microphone in front of a speaker or something? What? Do you remember when you played music in an in an in an, an after show once? You played um, like songs that you had recorded. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I couldn't talk when I was doing it though. Yeah, but how did right. you do it? I basically just played it and into had, a speaker. That, yeah, I had the speaker play. And it got picked up by the microphone. Okay, so I can do that. If you want to send me the music, I can play, I can like put it on my phone and plug my phone into a speaker. I could do that. Hmm. Hmm. 
It's up to you. Okay. Yeah. So I mean, I just feedback is sometimes an issue, but. Mm-hmm. What we what we could probably do is I what we totally. normally do in this scenario, which is record it, pretend to dance to the music, and Kiki can edit in music later. Right. Um, yes. Which may work better than us trying to do music and having it come out like half. Well, you could always dub or, over it with the better music if it's weird, that's right? That's true. That's true. We could. Yes. So yeah. I, don't know. I I do I yeah I can I will and I do dub over it with better music. But I'm just saying if, if it might be better for the live show to have it, I I'm happy to do that. Don't worry. About it. Well, I've got this whole other idea for what we're gonna do for next week's show. Hey, we're gonna oh? do something completely different. We're gonna have this new. We're gonna have a uh, like a completely different take on the way we do the show. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. I'm doing I'm do, I'm going to do the animal corner. Right. Right. You're going to do the disclaimer. We'll mix it we'll, we'll we'll jumble it all up. Um someone asked about my about the botanical thing. <sighs> Uh-oh. What happened? I, we saw photos. There was a Twitter picture or something of Yeah. Why why are you <laughs> oh, so yeah, uh, the video that was that was made related to Mimosa Pudica that uh, Blair created that we we did together. Um, it's done. It's up, and it is. It has been shared to Patreon supporters. So for the until next week, it will be available. Um, on the Patreon website, and I did send out a thing, so I was hoping that it would have been shared with you all, but sometimes you miss those emails or don't look at them. I've so got to start contributing to so, the so I can see this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. or, I can just, or, or I can just send you the link. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so basically it is private in the sense that if you have the link, you can watch it. So Is it, is it now um, in our chat room? I have not put it in the chat room. So well, show of hands, Blair and Justin, mm. and I guess people in the chat room. I don't know. Should should I share it with the chat room right now? Would oh, it says the pose is only visible to. Page. I can't see it. Well, I, I can know. give if you. Yeah, you can see it if you are a Patreon supporter of ours currently, oh, or yeah, if I give first. you the link. So if I give you the link right now in the chat room, or if I email you the I link, feel like I'm part of a society now. <laughs> I feel like I'm being left <laughs> out. Like, this is like high, this this is what, like, is, high speed this internet's going to be like. This was one of our right. The, no more net neutrality. You don't get to watch the twist. Net, net I don't, I'm against it. <laughs> you need net neutrality. I understand Patreon members are awesome, but I do also think like. They, I don't also want it to be like that's how you see. ah it's so twisted and torn in my I think you shouldn't you shouldn't share it that uh-huh. I should not share it yeah if you can't what contribute a dollar you have to wait a week <laughs> you gotta wait a week if you can't contribute a dollar but I can share it with Justin but we'll I'm gonna share it with Justin yeah okay I no longer uh, care I about the people now that I have <laughs> I care not about have-nots. You think you can buy me? You think you can buy me off that easily, Kirsten? No, no, no. It's I in there. Buy. I just put it. In, I just put it in the chat, Justin. I don't in, want in to the, see it. In I the don't Google. Want to even... Okay, it's in the Google Plus chat. You can click. Now that I, some people to. aren't allowed to see it, I don't want to see it either. It's just. Special. I'll wait with my brothers and sisters, who didn't happen to support the Patreon yet, and. How is it going with the Patreon, by the way? Do we have enough to do, like, the road trip to do the live show? Do we have, like, a... Can we can we spend the... It's we would need a hole more. in my pocket, and it's I don't even have it. We would need more to do a road trip. Definitely. Let's do a road trip. Let's get that Winnebago fired up. Let's go hit the road. Fire up that Winnebago. Fire it up. Bring the noise. Fire it up. 
Let's go make some poster boards Pretty and like pick it something for science. Pick it something for science. Hmm. Or like we could go and pick it like a sciencey organization and have it be all like, good job. <laughs> Thank you. Oh. Gold star. Well done. Keep up the science. Like, there's no positive protest. Nobody shows up and is like, yeah, you're doing great. <laughs> I think we have... Sorry, I'm still talking about this. But we have 139 people that have contributed to us. They all get to see the video. I think that's fine. Yeah. Yeah, Gord is saying... Gord, who also, I know you are a supporter, so you should be able to see it as well. Um, he's saying <laughs> there is the night attack argument that if you care about the show enough to mm -hmm. show up live, you get it regardless of whether you're a patron. Ah, which, that's pretty good. Which is true for this, for twists, for what we're doing right now. But what, what, um, what Blair and I did was put together a short that's totally separate. It's a it's a oh. twist short, and it's not something that you can show up for live. So oh. it's like a and special. It took equipment. It's every, everyone and will I... get to see it. Yeah. And everyone so it will, did kind yeah. of cost oh, money to make. My we have a yeah. paywall. Just this we, one thing. This is, we have this a paywall. Yeah, we it's a time about this release. release. It's a Just time release paywall. paywall. <laughs> we decided to agree. All of a sudden, we have a paywall, which I think I was there. No. Justin, it's not a paywall. It's a delay. It's it's, it's if embargo. you were so awesome embargoed as to content. embargoed content. No. Yeah. Yes, it is. That's what it Cause is. You're, cause everyone's we can think of it. yes. It's embargoed. We can think of our Patreon supporters as journalists, mm -hmm. and that they are getting a first glimpse at the article and chance to check it out and think about it a little bit before it actually goes live to the rest of the public. Well, what's so our Patreon is, audience is just getting a chance to mull it over a little yeah. bit more before everyone else gets to see it. And our other tens of thousands of listeners, regular listeners, get the get the edited down podcast version. Anyhow, they don't even know that they're missing it right now. That's true. Although next week, ooh, maybe, Kiki, should I be saying something next week in the break about the extra content? Because it will be released then, right? Yeah. So yeah. maybe something should be right, said at the, at the break about, you know, go to twist.org to see our first twist short, blah, 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 blah. Oh, I thought you were <laughs> going to announce the, the, the pinup calendar. <laughs> <laughs> yes, 12 months of Justin. <laughs> I mean, otherwise I still got to ask. Otherwise I have to ask you again. Well, I have to ask again, what was that photo shoot for if, if you weren't planning on using those photographs for a pinup calendar? I, I, and I, if there wasn't like, a reason for a thing, the costumes, I mean, they were cool and all, but some of the poses I figured it was just for the art. And I haven't heard anything about it since, so. Oh. 12 months of Justin. <laughs> the 12 faces of Justin Jackson. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> we should definitely do that. We should do, like, a Halloween picture of all of us in Halloween get-ups and... So you two are in San Francisco, which is a costume yeah. city. Oh, yeah. It just is. Yeah. It's a costume city. I am really bad. Thanks, Bugsy. We'll make them wait. Wait, what? I, okay, what? I'm really bad at costume. I need help with my Halloween costume this year. Mm-hmm. Because I, every year, I, like, forget to, like, work on it. You want to be the Higgs boson. Is that what I'm going to be? Like a big round? I would not even know what shape it would be. It would be a giant foam ball. I want... Have you guys seen the um, the video of the that inflatable ball soccer game? 
I don't know the link. I don't know the link for it, but it's really funny. It's like these inflatable hamster balls that like go around people's heads and bodies and basically it's like a donut shape. It's like a donut hole out the middle so that your your legs come out the bottom and you can run around and play soccer and kick a ball. But then like if two people come up against each other, the, the, each other, the balls bounce into each other and they, oh they go, like, people go flying and bouncing all over the place. Wow. It's like this Italian, it's some Italian thing. It's funny. Hmm? It's really funny. You could get yeah, one of those. I, I, I actually think the hamster ju- ball. In regards to the chat room conversations going on, the Justin calendar, Justin <laughs> pinup calendar, would be uh, actually hugely successful if if we had a a female audience, <laughs> uh, we have a largely male audience though, and I don't know is it is it is it that I don't see this is like this creates anxiety within me is it that I don't attract females to the show am I not doing yeah, my part exactly. are you two doing your part and and men are coming to the show gravitated by your female personality and my I'm just attract. Or, or is it, is it, is it possible that there is gender interest differences in science? Well, well, I know that there are other science websites that have much more uh, equal male to female percentages than we do. So it is well, not that. Is it's not it? Like we have none. Is I don't it mean our? Is it just our live audience that's skewed? Is our iTunes and YouTube are those views more even? And you know, it's just maybe it has to do with the the day of the week and the time that we do it, or I don't know the interface. There could be a lot of lots of things. Let me see. YouTube. I feel like maybe our YouTube stuff. Our YouTube audience is mostly male, too. Yeah, it's like 80% or more. Which is fine. But I love the idea of making a Justin calendar for everyone. Well, that's the thing. I I just don't... I have a (laughs) feeling if we did an even odd month, uh, Blair Le Kiki calendar, I have a feeling there'd be more demand for it. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I'm not going to do that. (laughs) I work. <laughs> oh, I would not do anything that would be um, uh, various states of undress, and yeah, no, that's not something. I Why? Do. Okay, so okay, yeah, so this is the female mind at work. Funny con, but funny, funny costumes. Would be immediately, really you assumed there was nakedness involved. Yeah, because you were talking about I, I don't know. appeal. Well, no, no, I'm just Plus saying. Plus calendar. Calendars that focus mostly on women involve women in states of undress. How many of these calendars do you own? Zero. I own wait, zero. Wait, wait a second. How but I've been calendar calendars? shopping enough when's to the last, No. When's the last time Top you went into the calendar store and saw scantily naked <laughs> ladies? No, it's like, Here's a calendar of, like, California monuments. Here's a calendar of different flowers painted by Georgia O'Keeffe. Here's a, a calendar of, it's like, it could be anything. It's a calendar. You make it up. It could be anything. Right. Oh, no old pics from Burning Man. Those don't end up romping in the wild, Ed. I try and keep my Burning Man pictures under wraps. <laughs> So even though I might go romping in the wild, those pictures stay under wraps. <laughs> yeah, that's what that's my goal usually. I try, I do try to maintain uh, a I've separation of my private and personal public we do life. A, okay, Kiki, you're right. Blair only calendar. A Blair calendar. Blair's animal calendar. Huh? What would this calendar be of? Twelve months of invertebrate sex. What else? <laughs> <laughs> what would the pictures be then? Well, that's what they would be. Invertebrate. Yeah. What and me Doing in the it. corner like this? 
You wouldn't even necessarily have to be. It could just be Blair's invertebrate sex calendar. Ah, <laughs> with a little blurb on each uh, month. Exactly. That's like why it's fun. Yeah. Yeah. I would make that. That would be that's pretty not a fun, bad right? idea. We could totally do that. They have um, websites, I'm sure, where you can make your own calendar, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We just have many months until that would be appropriate again. Right. Oh no, 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 no! See, this is where this is where a lot of calendar makers have gone bankrupt. Is waiting till like November, December to put their calendars out. People already bought their calendars. People already have next year's calendar. People buy mm -hmm. calendars earlier than you think. If you wait till usually they do, yeah. Yeah, you know what? That's a great looking calendar. I've already got three for next year. I'm good. Thank you. People are yeah. People are usually yeah. on top of that more yeah. than I am. Yeah, and it's not like it's not like you don't have stuff to plan for for next year. Hopefully, hopefully you're in good enough condition that you're planning next year's birthday party. You want to know what day of the week it's? It, best thing you can do, ask for next year's days off now. If you're if you're working and you need a schedule, figure out next year's schedule. Turn those into your boss. Look how on top of things you are. Here's here's the days off I need next year. Just so those are locked out of the way. Plan around them. Okay. Next year, these are my days. Hmm. Blizz nice. and Six Corner Calendar. Calendar. <laughs> it's a calendar. Maybe not with Blair, but with animals. With Blair's, Blair's sex calendar. We'll just call it that. It'll come, <laughs> it'll have like the black plastic wrapping on it, right? When we show it. We, we wish we could show you the calendar. We'll just have a black cover. But we're not, we're not able to at this time. Wrapped in black plastic, oh, gonna come in a paper bag, and it's gonna it'll be billed to the Twist Swag website, not to anything else. Yeah, you can order the Blair sex calendar now. Wow, too bad we're talking about this life. People wouldn't know what hit them. Right, <laughs> Frights for Bobots says someone would come into your house and see it and go, "What the hell is that?" <laughs> what is that? And then you can say, well, there. this is a sea slug, and... <laughs> oddly, yeah. And oddly, this, this here, that's this a lady animal part. engages in this traumatic this insemination. This stabs its mate in the head with its penis. <laughs> and injects some... <laughs> Seminal fluid. Fluid there. Into their into head. Into head. Space. Oh dear! So I could that do the, the sea slug. I could do the bed bugs. I could do the insect we talked about tonight. Mm -hmm. A few different types of spiders. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know what else. There has to be more. There are more. You could do some, yes, yeah, some spiders. A couple of different kinds of spiders, maybe. Um. Yeah, like three different. There are more. Spiders. It's only half of a calendar. Um. See, if you, you start, you start looking around though. We'll, we'll find them. Yeah. All we have to do is go back through like last year, and I bet we'll have twelve mm -hmm. stories easily. Mhm. Mm <laughs> Blair pointing. <laughs> Lizard's mate. Blair pointing at pictures of Bill Nye calendar. <laughs> Me shaking hands with a cutout of Bill Nye at various locations. <laughs> <laughs> I like that one. Ed from Connecticut would like to know who would win a twist dance-off. Mm. Oh, yeah, it's the squid. I forgot about the squid that I talked about. Justin would win. What the squid. Like? And there's an octopus that's super cool. Now she's going on the... She's like, hmm, let's see. Calendar. <laughs> we'll get the list. Mm -hmm. I'll <laughs> think like, about it. Uh, we have to find not... That's very technical sounding. Ajo. 
Or pay yeah, for I know. That would copyrighted be the thing. images. Yeah. Pay for copyrighted images or um, either pay for copyrighted images or use your artistic talents. Oh, I could draw them. Draw pictures. I like draw pictures that. of them. Yeah, that's not a bad idea. Or, or, or you could you could do. Uh, they they can't all be copyrighted, right? Like some of this research has to be done. They're usually, kind of low quality if they're not copyrighted. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Let's just get the copyrighted. I stuff. mean, you would have to. Like, You'd have to get these images probably from researchers who are working with the animals and have taken pictures of them. And and, and guess you know. what? Guess what? You're the yeah. first person ever to call them <laughs> to ask to use. Hey, the, hey I'm making a calendar. Do you have? Yeah. 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 And they're gonna. And it's actually more of, hey, congratulations, we've selected your photo to be part of our calendar. Aren't mm -hmm. you lucky? And that's it. They'll be like, yeah, awesome, my photo. They're going to use it in the calendar. Bad invertebrate sex. This is awesome. I'm going to tell my friends. That's how, that's more likely. Yeah. That or I could, yeah. It would also be cool to, like, use 12 different um, techniques of drawing and, and coloring things. That okay. would be pretty fun, mm -hmm. too. Okay. I think the photos would be better. You could do both. <laughs> you could do both. I could do a side by side. You could do both. Yeah. Yeah. Has my video slowed down a lot for you guys? Yeah, you're becoming slightly pixelated and your mouth is moving out of sync with your words. Okay. Oh, I don't so know who is this yours. person is that I'm going to pose as. Am I going to be offended by this chat room? Probably, right? By what? <laughs> oh, Eliza Dushku? No. I guess she's what? awesome. What are you guys talking about? She oh, was in Dollhouse, an and she was from Buffy. Yeah, she's an actress. She was. Um, There's a lot of her mostly when I look her up on the internet. <laughs> oh yeah, she's done a lot of that too. But she's also she's a she's she's kind of a little powerhouse down in Hollywood actually. Who what? Do you have of this a, a pic of this octopus, but naked, naked octopuses? When is an octopus not naked? Oh! <laughs> I just, I see When a it's a jar? Things. Oh, wait, that's the wrong joke. Damn. Never mind. Uh, then we get new guests for the show, right? Then we get new listeners. <laughs> <laughs> that's Tony not Steele how to get help more, more women there. listening, though. I'm pretty sure that's not how. Yeah. All right, all right. So I've no. got to start doing the show topless. I got it. There we go. <laughs> Mink whale ringtones. Nice. <laughs> oh, my God. That's pretty oh, funny stuff. Oh, I've heard of Octodad. Okay. okay. Um, Lizard's mate, thank you. <laughs> Quack. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I was. Uh, I was actually surprised we didn't have audio on that. I'm trying. I'm gonna try and find it. You know what you could do. You know what you could do, Blair. Mm. You could do a comic strip. Of. Of. Each month, you have the you have the 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 different invertebrate sex weirdness or right each month there's a different one right mm -hmm. but then the panels which would be the months you could fill in with cartoons like a comic strip mm -hmm. of the social implications or just do you could do mm -hmm. one maybe at the bottom <laughs> like one comic strip at the bottom social social implications of whatever that interesting that that, that could be interesting. Right? <laughs> you, could, you could be like the Gary Larson of invertebrate sex. <laughs> Perfect. I like that. That'd be funny. Gary Larson of invertebrate sex. 
Okay, advertisement, go away. Um, so, hang on. I, you know I just yellingly I tweeted about the Patreon and that if people wanted to see the thing. If you want to see this video, you have to be a patron. Yeah. <laughs> I got yeah. a, I don't know where I don't Ooh. have a Patreon button on my web. How can, why is that? Why do I always have to go look it up? You hear that? So yeah, that would freak me out if I didn't know it was coming from a whale and it was coming from deep under the ocean. I know it sounds like a what bird. The heck? It's a mink whale. It sounds like a UFO. It's a very similar sound. It's, of course, it's, yeah, just like a UFO. Very similar. Uh, 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 uh. No, I do not want that as a ringtone. <laughs> I'll pass. Do, actually, uh, 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 uh. It's a little hypnotic. Do you think? Uh, 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 uh. So, it's going to be dance music patron, next thing we know. If I was a patron on Patreon, um, would I be able to read like comments from other patrons on things in the feed? On in the Patreon feed? Yeah, in the activity feed of Patreon. Are there mm -hmm. comments there? Yeah, there are comments because you can't see them if you're not a patron. Which is why I can't see them. Oh, there we go. Byron Lee. Byron Lee said, Blair, is this the first of your fabulous television career? I'm going to save this in a vault for future generations to admire. Oh, boy. Aurora, Aurora <laughs> Lee said, loved this short. Hope there will be more. Oh, good. Yeah. Got a couple Lovely. of nice comments. That's a girl? Who? Aurora Lee. Byron Lee? What? Oh, no, no, no. So maybe, maybe uh, Blair has uh, cross-gender appeal. That I wasn't... <laughs> what? I'm just saying. You're just saying. Um, just saying. Just insane. Just in saying, of course. Where did I see? Is it on our website? Was our website? Uh, somebody, somebody, uh, somebody said that I interrupt too much. Don't read comments on the I'm, website. <laughs> uh, somebody said, somebody said like, wait, what? I interrupt. I interrupt the conversation, the flow of conversation, too often. And I want to, I want to tell whoever, whoever that was, I completely agree with you. Hmm. All right. I'm always Listers afraid to read the says, Whale sounds sounded like Mongolian throat throat singing. Yeah, it, it actually <clears throat> sound. It's what's weird about it. What's really odd about that sound is that's the sound you hear when you're inside of a UFO. That's what it sounds like. When you're outside, it doesn't sound like that. But when you're inside, that's like the hum of the the mechanism that makes it go. Whatever that trans morgified space time reality generator is. The trans generator. So Blair, Blair's got a, a a calendar project now. <laughs> um, she's got some cartooning to do. Mm -hmm. Kiki, what are you doing? Can you tell us what you're doing? I don't know what you're doing. Why aren't you? Why? Are, what is so? Oh, next Thursday, I am going uh, to be moderating a panel for UCSF and a group here in the city called Swiss Next on the future of reproduction. So There's going to be a chain, like. Something it's a different. one-off. Huh? Something different than what we've been doing. Let's not make... What's that Woody Allen movie? Where they go into the machine? Oh, yeah. And then the steak is steak is good for you? Yeah. We did it, which is fine. 
But so what? Can we get a preview? Can we get a sneak preview right now? What is? Oh, you're just monitoring the panel, so you're asking the questions. You're not. I'm asking questions. Yeah. Answers. Yeah. All right, all right. We'll give you this week, but <laughs> what? And yeah. then at the end of May, it's gonna happen again. I sent you what? guys an email like four weeks I ago saying that these remember. things were when, gonna happen. Specifics. I didn't read the specifics. May first like, uh... and May twenty ninth. I have these events, and they happen to collide with Thursdays. And I was like, "You people, why do you make your events on Thursdays?" And they were like, "Well." What? And I was like, okay. But this cannot be a regular occurrence. Uh-uh. I found the comment, Justin. It's funny. <laughs> right? Don't worry about it. So, 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 but I agree with them. Like, it's, po it's very possible I interrupt too often. It, it's hard. It's a hard format to, like... Are you going to do buzz in before you talk? Well, so yeah, part of that too is, part of the, it is weird. It's a weird dynamic with three people. Because with two people, it's pretty obvious. The other person's got a pregnant pause. There's a pause. There's a silence. You could drive a truck through the silence, and the silence would still be there at the end of it. And so in doing live radio, there's some like FCC rule or something. Like if you're, if you're quiet for four seconds... They take away your license, shut down the antenna, and you're off the air forever. <laughs> like something where you have to continually be generating noise doing live radio. Right. Right. Uh, so, so that's part of it. And it's, it is funky with three people because, okay, there's a pause, there's a drop-off. I'm ready to throw. So the other person also was ready to, and we both, bam, smacked into each other trying to jump into the silence. Um, so there's that. There's also, I like to think when I interject things, it's because I'm the voice of reason. It's a very good reason for it. Um, <laughs> occasionally I interrupt and I think, well, you know, I really didn't mean to say that. <laughs> Maybe to add that. That should have just, that's a, that's a thing that somebody listening at home should have just added to it and I really didn't need to say it out loud. But then, but then, what if they didn't? What if they didn't add that, and they didn't? Then I feel like it was my duty to point out the thing. It might have been obvious, or might not have been. All right. So I made the run sheet for next week, but I haven't changed anybody's part stuff. So it's there now. Cool. It's in a new spreadsheet. Another way we can do it there is. Mm. Um, is is we still do our parts like we always do, right? But when it comes to stuff that Kiki would say, we both say it in unison together. <laughs> <laughs> that can't go wrong at all. <laughs> right? Sarcasm. <laughs> I think it would be cool. I don't know. I think if we come off, if we pull it off, if we pull it off, if we get close to pulling it off even, I think it would come off yes. pretty cool. Um. Mm. Is it bedtime now? It's totally bedtime. Yeah. So. Bug, bug. So oh, I have a question though. Um, what is the plan? Like, what day is that thing dropping, and where is it going to show up? Oh. Um. What? Let's see. So I. Published it. Hey, no, wrong way. I published it on. Everything is slow. April twenty first at four forty five p.m. So. Um, What's dropping? What happened? What's dropping? The it drop. Sounds like there's a plane dropping out of the sky where I'm at right now. But wait, what? What are you talking about? Oh, I can the hear plane. that. High pitched noise, yeah. Yeah, it's um, seriously like coming coming down really quickly. 
not where the airport is. I'll wait for the explosion before I go looking for bodies. <laughs> Is it an asteroid? Uh, is it a meteor? Is it a, a probably not? Space probably station? just one of those big airplanes, those sea whatevers, big ones. What? Wait. What are you talking? Wait. What was Blair asking you? What's gonna what drop? The f is that? Google the short the we've been talking about forever. The what? The short. Short what? The plant thing that we posted that only Patreon supporters could see. Well, it's gonna go public next week. Oh my goodness. It's going public? Well, that's why we were saying it's not a paywall. So it's Monday. Like a paywall. An embargo on, paywall. I, I released it on Monday so I can make it public on you know, Monday. I think, I think it's fine. I, actually, I think it's okay because I feel like it's uh, it's like a screening. It's like doing a screening. It's like mm -hmm, you shot exactly. the movie. You invite, you invite the cast and crew over. They get to watch. Maybe some family. Maybe some acquaintances come along. They see the screening. So, some loudmouth goes, Ah, that one scene was absolute. He didn't need it. It's like cousin so-and-so. He's not actually in the industry. But then the directors and the you know and the writer look, talk to each other and they're like, Actually, Bastard's right. That doesn't belong there. Like, we should fix it before we release it. Cause, so that could be there, too, right? You know, we could get some helpful criticism if it's... Uh, some, but, yeah, so uh, it's going to drop. It can't drop next week. It can't drop next week, though. Because Kiki's going to be sequestered on a sex panel. It's uh, true. <laughs> so We're not actually talking about the sex. We're talking about, uh, yeah, it's the, the it, results it, of sex. Yeah, I, I don't Probably. know how you can talk about procreation. Well, it's, well, there yeah. are ways, actually. But I don't know if that's what this I have no idea. So it won't be next mm -hmm. week. It'll be the week after. So it's two more weeks. Two more weeks before I get to see it. Why I just I put it in the in the chat. I didn't it, notice. It's still there. It's sitting there. If you just go to the I, chat, I'm, going, I'm not right going to there. watch it. It's right there, Justin. Just in the chat, right? I'm not right. in the not in the twist chat, but in our little group chat in the in the hangout. Okay, I'm not going to watch this until my people. My people are free. <laughs> really? Not solid. I'm going to stay solid with my peeps and. <laughs> Who don't have the dollar, and I'm gonna, you know, wait. Until, well, actually, I'm gonna cheat. I gotta see this. Where is that? <laughs> I have to see it. Where is it at? I don't. There's so much chat room that went on. No, no it's in the Google Hangouts. Google Hangout chat. The Google Hangout chat. We have a Google Hangout chat. Oh my yeah, god. Yeah, just You've for talked us. On it before. How how long have you done? How long have you been doing this? Oh, there is something. the top there. thing. Okay, I see it now. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Justin. Let's talk about sex, baby. Oh, Let's it's like three and a half minutes. And me. Oh, sure. Let's talk That's about all the good things and the bad things that may be. Let's talk about... Three and a half minutes. That's a short. Let's talk about sex. Blair's talking. Let's talk about sex. Let's talk about sex. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, did you see the bicyclist in the background who's mocking you? Yes. Yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that was happening at the time. I couldn't stop him. I was like, "Yeah, you just came in there, and we'll just let it go. We'll let it go." A mute button. There oh it is. Goodness. He's watching it. So we're going to have three and a half minutes of watching Justin yeah, watch watching. I'm watching it too. <laughs> there, you it's can like, see it in the reflection of Justin's glasses. <laughs> it's a learning process. I think the next one will be better. Yeah. Well, I thought I what I wanted to do was make sure that you did one so that you saw what happened with it and then, like, you can... We can talk about what you'd like to do better and different. Yeah. And so the video quality, by the way, is freaking amazing. Habituate. <laughs> Habituate. <laughs> it's like when you said zoologist that one time. I don't know why. I, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's my like, child teacher thing. 
Yeah. So you guys say <laughs> habituate? I'm a zoologist, and it almost should be followed by you. Like, well, I can't say. I can say it in private, but you, you GED carrying troglodyte. <laughs> 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 I thought it was good. We got we got an interview with it with an expert a little bit. We put a bunch of things in there. It was good. Yeah. I just wish I had um Wait, there were other things that I would have done, like bells and whistles that I would have liked to have seen added to it if there were more time and if I had the ability to do them. Like what? Graphics and things to make mm. things like pop a little bit. But Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I did. That was totally awesome. Nice. Very cool. <laughs> well done. I mean, it's not a bad first one. No. No. Oh. That was very good. That was, and the quality of the the uh, the shoot was the lighting, the the camera, and everything. That's the only thing. Like I've always, whenever Thank I try to shoot much. something, and I thank you. I might just go into I might just go into camera work, editing, and directing from now on. <laughs> I'll just be behind. Let Blair be the oh please in front of camera girl. Yeah, Blair did a great. Blair, you did awesome. Yeah, I think the plant, Blair did awesome. I think the plant did a good job too. The plants did a great job. Yeah. They're the real stars. I think the goth biker <laughs> troll in the background. <laughs> you know, you weren't. Yeah, yeah, you came across pretty good. I think came across the pretty well. Exploratorium. What is he? Who is he kidding? Acting like he's too cool for this stuff. He's at the exploratorium. <laughs> uh, he may be a bike messenger. They're cooler than everyone. Maybe. They deliver messages. Uh, or he's like, visiting ironically. <laughs> <laughs> oh ironically. my goodness. So um so now we have video content. What what's next? More video content. Oh, more more. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm waiting for the right story to um I think that's uh, the thing with the, with the shorts. Yeah, I think we should just if there's a cool story that will work and there's like some location that we can go to or you know even just you know we can set up a something at one of our houses or something but mm -hmm. I, still I think, just the, I think the key is not to have it be something that we do all the time yet but just something that we do when we can and something a story comes up that we really want to do yeah I have a few locations that I know are willing if the right thing comes up too so I've got one it's the house of the future here in Davis totally yeah perfect. I um I talked briefly with that with the guy the PR guy and yeah. I have to get back in touch with him we we have to talk again but yeah, yeah. um I, I still I still have some love for this idea I had a long time ago for doing like Really pedestrian, like wildlife kingdom y, like presentation y stuff. Like, you know, like do a, uh, an animal corner. On, this is a cow. Well, I was kind Cows of thinking about doing like an animal cows. highlight. I thought that might be fun. Yeah. Like, obviously, first one would be hippos. <laughs> I think you should. I think you totally should. Especially since you may still have enough contacts at a zoo to get Maybe. yourself access mm -hmm. to uh, animals to film. If, if nothing else, I could do it. Um, if I go back to Israel, I could do it at that zoo for sure. Be because 
No, no rules about interacting with animals, obviously. Well, As, there's that. They, they like her better in Jerusalem. But no. they also like me better <laughs> in Jerusalem. Really? Oh, how can anybody not like you? I never said anyone didn't like me. Well, I said they like me better. Contrast, you kind of did sort of sound like it meant that. No, we can probably figure it out. Yeah. Especially if you did it real quick and I just didn't tell anybody. <laughs> there, there's always that. Gorilla filming, by the way, I'm all for it. I've done lots of gorilla filming. Not not the, not the um, you know, like in the jungles filming gorillas, but like filming locations without permits kind of a thing. Biker I have an in with some sharks. I know that. Okay. That's can awesome. You get, can you get an interview? Um, if I With get my shark? scuba certification, I could. So well, maybe I should wait for that. I should wait for my scuba certification, and then Kiki can film me in a tank with a shark. Ooh. Yeah. You know. <laughs> Does Twist want to pay for my scuba certification? No. <laughs> wait a minute. <laughs> it's a if we get more Patreon sponsors, yeah. yes. Oh, totally. <laughs> yeah, you guys, you up your Patreon amounts, and I'll get scuba certified, and I'll swim with sharks. And Absolutely. We'll film it. And then you can watch it. Mhm. Mm and then other, then we'll film it and let people watch it. That'll be all part of it. Yeah. Um, whiskey renegade hippos don't let fish clean their teeth. Hippos let fish clean their posterior. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Every time a hippo poops, fish just come running in to eat it. No way. Well, because they're related to like horses and other herbivores, and so they don't have the most efficient gut system. That's so the food, the food that comes out of their rear end is pretty whole. Don't need to keep. Don't so it's more. high in nutrition. Yeah. Hippo poop. You could eat it. You could. <laughs> um, in fact, hippos are, um, they're not, but uh, they're related to animals that are coprophagous. That means they, Bunny eat rabbit. Their, they eat their own poop. Bunnies, horses. Yeah, yeah animals that um, poop out stuff that kind of still looks like grass, a lot of the time they'll eat it again because they haven't gotten enough nutrients out of it yet. I'm going to eat it again and again and again. Ew. And again. <laughs> uh -huh. What do you mean tired and punchy and giggly? This little glass of vodka I drank? No. Mm. Water. I'm trying to be healthy. I drank tea I'm from this tired. mug that has a burrowing owl on it. Oh, they have, uh, I think we have those nearby. I think I used to in see Davis. That. I think there's burrowing owls up there. No, yeah, they were in uh, Vacaville, but close there you there used to be burrowing owls in Davis. There was a whole patch of dirt for a long, long time off of one of the streets that they wouldn't let anybody build on it forever because they thought there were still burrowing owls on it. They were trying to preserve it, but it was right next to this busy road, and there were no birds there. Well, that's and actually so they one. finally built on it. Where the burrowing owls I remember seeing in Vacaville were on a pretty busy road, actually. They were right off of it, between a golf course and a very busy road. They had this big stretch, and you could see them out there pretty much daily. I like how Blair is, like, clarifying in the chat room. What she's I know saying. a lot about poop, okay? <laughs> but it's just Sex hilarious watching what you add. I know about. I was watching Blair's comments come into the chat room. It's like, uh, someone someone mentioned something about dogs sigh. So CR one says yeah eat dog eat dog eating poop right dogs sigh. And then Blair Baz says that's not why dogs do it though though they get little to no nutrition. Next line from poop. <laughs> and then do you like what I wrote underneath that? Yeah. So <laughs> dog poop is mostly crap. <laughs> <laughs> Comparatively to hippo poop. Dogs eat it because it <laughs> smells. It's like um, 
it's like a communication thing and they're babies and they're trying to figure it out and they don't they don't really know that they should just smell it and move on and not actually <laughs> eat it. Yeah. They're just like, "Oh, this smells like food. Let me eat this." I've heard though that they eat cat poop because there's an enzyme in there that they don't naturally get in their diet. Really? I've never heard that. I've hmm. had I had a dog that was like every walk was simply a a a mission to find cat poop to eat. And man, oh man, to any cat poop anywhere, this dog was like... <laughs> it was... it was t Taking the dog for the walk was the most disgusting yeah. adventure every time. Wow. So yeah, year one, sex calendar. Uh, invertebrate sex calendar. Year two, poop calendar. No, 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 no. But all animals' poop looks looks so different, and there's lots of really interesting facts about it. Yeah, but is it something you want up on the wall for a month? I don't know. Maybe not. Like, I would have um, poop the of the kitchen. African savanna would be one month. So you could have giraffe poop and kudu poop and oryx poop and ostrich poop and zebra poop all on one page. <laughs> <laughs> the best the part is you guys are not going to like this. <laughs> You're not going to like this, but when I worked uh, in an African savanna exhibit and I was raking up all of the various types of poop, you'd like, if something was runny, you'd have to like know, know whose it was, whatever. So you had to know which type of poop was which. And I classified all the various uh, hooved animal poop by its likeness to certain candies. <laughs> so there were uh, milk duds. There were raisinets. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, there were malt balls. There were junior mints. <laughs> and then there were, there were like ice cream. I think that's funny. <laughs> yeah. Junior mints. Yeah. I like the raisinets. Yeah, the raisinets were the um, the oryx were raisinets, and the kudu were milk duds, and the giraffe were malt balls, malted milk balls, and then the zebras were <laughs> ice cream scoops, because it just looks like bear poop or um, horse poop. <laughs> Um, I don't know if you guys ever saw the Mythbusters where they tried out the myth you can't polish a turd. <laughs> did they really? They did. They went to the zoo really myth and, they, that more, and they, took, a saying. they took grizzly bear poop and they actually polished it into this gorgeous like marbleized um, ball. It was so cool. Oh my goodness. Um, also, at some zoos you can buy elephant poop paper. So they turn elephant huh. poop into notebooks. Oh, that's kind of cool. Oh, yeah, I've seen that before. I've, I've never seen, seen that. that but the, the poop paper, really yeah. They, at the San Diego Zoo, they sell a few different kinds of paper made of poo. What was I going to say? Uh, for next week's show... I'm setting up a uh, a thing for it, so I think really you'll just have to go and become a manager of the page, Twist, okay. uh -huh. and, um, and then go to events, and then just click on the event to start it. Okay. So you click; it'll be okay. It'll be the, the upcoming events, and then you just you click on the one that it is, and then okay. And then you should go to that page and be able to start it. So who's going to start it? Me or Justin? Yes. And we'll, we'll... decide now. Who's going to okay. start? Okay. Um I think I think if you're going to be twists, you have to start it. Right. So are you going to be twists or am I going to be twists? Oh, gotcha. Um Yeah, I could be twists. Yeah, okay. I can do it. So you have the login for it? Uh, there's a login? 
Yeah, you have to log into the Google account for Twist to do it. Yeah. Oh, I don't think I do. Do I? Hmm. I guess I do. I guess I do. I actually was Twist when I first tried to sign on today, which I think it accidentally made me the manager of the site. I don't know if I. Well, well, send me whatever deets I would need to log into it, Kiki, and uh, yeah, it'll be up and running in time next week. Okay. Yeah, why don't you send it to both of us just in case? All right, sounds good. Yeah, just go ahead and carbon copy my intern. Uh, uh huh. In case I've got a lot of my plate that day, I might need to delegate. I'm sorry. Did you just call me your intern? <laughs> <laughs> I was never your intern, Justin. Yeah. Just to be what? You were the show's intern. <laughs> I think they both already are managers, Gord. Yeah. I think you both are managers of the page. I have made them managers. See, she does like me better. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not picking favorites. You people. Good <laughs> I'm just saying, Kiki always had tasks for me when I was an intern. What did you ever have me do? She never, oh, I thought you said, what did she ever have you do? I was like, nothing. <sighs> she, 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 our meetings were like this. Justin? Yeah, Kiki? You going to bring me awesome? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. That what it, was that what, how they went? I think that's pretty much what the, how the meetings were. That's what I took away from the meetings. I know there was a lot of, like, details and stuff that you were like, oh, I thought it was more like, Justin, show up, don't be late, don't mess up. <laughs> <laughs> don't mess take, up. It did take a, a while to get the bag of trust when I was taking a tang tangent that it wouldn't be some sort of sexist, racist, politically incorrect tirade into aliens are real and they're here to steal <laughs> our women. I don't I don't know where you thought it would ever be going. But there was always like I don't yeah. trust where this conversation is going. For a I long time there was I right. had there, there was like tightness in my chest when you'd start talking about some things. I was like, what is he gonna do with when do I kick him? When at what point? I just my my foot was ready. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. Goodness. So we'll have fun. We'll have fun. All right. Well, I need to go to bed. I have to wake up at five. That's early. What? Yeah. Oh my gosh! If I were you, I would just stay up at this point. Nope. Shh, not There's even. Really, not any point of going to sleep at this hour when you have to be up at that hour. Justin, you're crazy. Yeah. It's still six hours. That's crazy. Six hours for sleeping? Yep. It takes me six hours to get to sleep. That's part of your crazy. Oh, all That's right. That's part of your crazy. All right, go ahead. How much sleep do you expect? Cram sleep. Huh? I like I like to get a good 12 hours a day. Oh, my God. That's That's how I feel like I'm really ready to take on the day. That sounds so nice. Isn't it? Uh, interview George Norrie? I don't know if interviewing George Norrie... And I, I don't know if I'd be a good for, fit for George Norrie's show, but I would love to have a beer with George Norrie and, and talk to him. Just off there. It would be awesome. Well, actually, if we recorded it, I guess it could be played. And we could even do it live. Yeah, no, I would love to have George Nuri on the show. He's the, he's the closest thing I think uh, I can accept in the void that is Art Bell's leaving. Mm. Yeah. What is happening? I'm hearing what. Are you there's hearing what I'm watching? Happening. Yeah. Beep, oh, beep, oh. Beep. What's going on over there? Blair's over there, like, watching YouTube videos. I'm She's watching YouTube videos that someone sent me. Can you hear it? A little no, bit, not yeah. Really. Why can you hear it? That's weird. It's. I mean, we can hear it like it's in the background. We can't hear it like... Probably just because your headphones are so loud. Because you young kids with your, your loud music. You yeah, loud music, yeah. young kids. Okay. 
I'm watching I'm a Climate Scientist. Kirsten's, laugh, Kirsten's laughing because <laughs> she, she's the one, she's the one, when they got like the 20-foot speaker, the like two-story speaker at the front of the stage, she's the one dancing in front of it, and when the bass beats are hitting, her clothes are vibrating like, boop, 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 like they're mm -hmm. bouncing along with the music, so. Right. Comments on young people. <laughs> I don't dance right in front of the speakers. I, I like my ears much too much for that. Okay. Whatever, Kiki. All right, minions. I got to get my 12 hours of sleep. Yeah. Go to hell. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like sitting here filling out future hangouts so that we've got them set up. An advert. Ah, I didn't want to do that. I want to do a public service announcement warning people about cats. Can we fit that into one of the? Sure. No. That we do. <laughs> what? As long as it's all factual. Yeah, I'm not gonna make any up stuff. I don't need to. Like That's he could. It, I mean, it could be jokey, but it could be all real stuff that we've reported. Anything I do has Loki involved. That could be fun. Yeah. I don't think it would be fun. <laughs> why? Why wouldn't it be fun? Is it like thing? cats? Is that why? I like cats. Okay. Well, that's, there's nothing wrong with liking cats as long as you're aware of how dangerous they are. Yes. You know... Yes, I'm aware. When people engage in dangerous, risky behaviors. You don't want to. You don't want to prevent them from knowing the facts about that risky behavior. You want them to know all the risks involved in their risky behavior, such as owning it's cats true. or having okay. contact with other people's cats, or allowing cats to share the surface of the earth with humans. Shh. We we need a little extreme there, buddy. Okay, okay, well we you know, this is just I'm just right now I'm just I'm just bouncing ideas off the wall. You know, getting the ideas, kinda getting the mm -hmm. maybe I'll go for a walk and have some better ideas. But we'll figure it out. We'll do a, a PSA on 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 cat danger. I was thinking of a rhyme like stranger danger, but with cats and I can't think of it. I'll have to think about it. Cat scat fever? Mm -hmm. That's huh? good. Yeah? It's, we, we've already got a song for it then. Cat scat fever. Cat Woo! Dr. Plasma in the bottle of beer. <laughs> so, <laughs> details. All right, I really have to go. It's almost 11. It is. I've, I'm, gonna, I'm yeah. only going to get 11 hours. It's almost 11. I've done later. some work while I've been here with you guys, so this is good. Getting some of my some of my producer work done. Oh, All right, I'm, uh, listener mate. I'm, Twitch I'm, soon. It's time to go to sleep. I'm gonna put on coast to coast with you. I think that's a good idea. I haven't listened to tune. He just tuned right out there. He really did. Me. He multitasked. Too much. Yeah, too much multitasking. We're gonna um, we're gonna go hang out uh, virtually uh, without a chat room, listening to coast to coast. Nice. Everyone, thank you so much for watching tonight. Thanks for hanging out during our after show and watching us watch videos. Or I was just watching them watch videos too. So, yeah, it was awesome. Thanks once again. I'll see you guys next week.